Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to episode, I don't know yet, of Mind Heist. I'm here with Kaya today to speak about business. How are you, Kaya? Business. Assalamu alaikum. How's it going? Good, bro. Not too bad. Alhamdulillah. Just uh, figured out our audio issues. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'm good, man. I'm, I'm excited to talk about business with a businessman. So uh, let's jump into it, oh, yeah? yeah? Let's talk about, um, you know, the way, like, what's your kind of business lifestyle? Like, how do you live? How do you live business? Well, because some people, obviously, um, I know many people that are, are self-employed rather than business people, if you know what I mean. And they'll be like yeah. working, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. They kind of got to go out there. If they're not doing the work themselves, they got to supervise the work a lot. Um, and then yeah. you have other people who are like, uh, you know, uh, which people kind of see as the holy grail where they're, they're not really just kind of managing stuff. So what, what would you say your lifestyle is? And, and tell yeah, us as well um, a little bit about your business and what type it is. Yeah, I think that's probably the best place to start so people understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. So my business, um, we're a service, uh, business services company. So we help uh, software companies with their content. So we write their blog posts, we write their website content, landing pages. We write, we write for them basically, right? Mm. Um, and I've been doing that myself and I was freelancing self-employed before I started this business <clears throat> um, for about seven, like maybe five years before the business began. So I've kind of lived that sort of freelancing life and self-employed life too. Mm. In terms of how I run the business, it's, it's a bit of both. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the totally off, you know, hands off boss who just like doesn't do anything, just, just manages and like sits back and does nothing. But I also don't want Dubai to buy lifestyle. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't want to be the kind of person who's like um doing every you know micromanaging everything and doing every task themselves you know i've tried to have a bit of a balance the aim is to take myself out of the business as much as possible but really only so i could work on other parts of the business like sales mm. marketing branding that kind of yeah. thing right yeah so I, I never really see myself as being totally hands-off yeah um Maybe one day in Shah Life I have like multiple businesses. I'll be hands off in all of them, bar one or bar two or something like that. Mm. But um, I, I'd always see myself as being someone who wants to get involved in some way, you know, yeah. especially around marketing, sales, branding. Yeah. By the way, I'm going to make an effort here not to interview you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was going to say because I've got questions for you as well. Don't yeah, worry. yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's exactly. not going to be interview today. So shall we make it just a conversation? Um, mm. Obviously, when you say like. Uh, uh, service of business basically what that is is done for you meaning you're doing something so that that company that's hiring you doesn't have to do it isn't it and i, yeah. I don't know for me that that kind of description is better because ultimately they're just like uh i don't know i think that frames the way they see you and it's like maybe some of them they feel like yeah i might i can do this myself but it's like you just do it it's like to get rid of yeah. the hassle yeah isn't it mm. so that i think yep. frames like how the relationship is a little bit um but i have learned because uh at least until more recently i also had a service business like you done for you business where of course we were like running ads for people on facebook on google uh setting up uh funnels um doing content on social media uh yeah those and email marketing so we were doing these kind of services uh, we've also done uh, crowdfunding campaigns. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different things. And what I get, bro, because you're also in marketing, of course, and we, we both basically have or had or have marketing agencies, right? And it's like, yeah. uh, I just feel like too much, at least the, a lot of the prospects I speak to, they just want to hand off marketing completely. In, in your case, mm. I think they're smarter because they're like, okay, we got a marketing team. We're doing SEO. We're doing this and this and this. Uh, we just want to outsource one portion of that to a specialist who is going to do yeah. uh, you know, content like specifically, like you don't even do social content. You do uh, written longer form uh, blog post kind of articles, right? Yeah. Um, yep. But like the idea for me to like outsource all of marketing is nuts because that's like a pillar of the business. Mm, I agree with you. I agree. Um, most of the clients we have, um, they have marketing teams. So they'll have yeah. like 
the main person in charge of marketing and they may have an extra person who like does some additional tasks mm. and then they'll, they'll keep it very lean like that. And then they'll use agencies to, to do everything mm. else. Yeah. So those, those guys will sort of manage the agency. So have us doing the written content, yeah. they have somebody else doing like video content, mm. they have another agency just doing SEO and those guys will just manage them and make sure mm. the content that comes through is good quality. Yeah. But the people that are managing the agencies, do they know marketing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're marketers. Yeah. Most so of they'll be like marketers themselves. So they understand yeah. all the stuff. And that works if you can afford it, right? So you, afford, you hire mm -hmm. like five different agencies, each one charging you two, three, four, five thousand dollars a month. And, you know, if you got the money, that's fine. Uh, but yeah. then if you don't have the money, you can't just like hire one specialist agency because then you're not getting it all done, in it? So uh, that just puzzles some companies, me. Some companies do, but it's probably not the best way to go, though. Yeah, you're right. Some companies do what? Some companies do hire just one agency to do everything, but it's mm. probably not the but best they, way to do it. I don't things. feel you can be excellent at more than one thing. I agree. No. Even, I, agree. Some even just, I, said, I said we do ads, funnels, email marketing, and social content, right? Now, that is, that is a little bit narrow, right? It's not everything. But I mm. feel like if we remove like one or two of those things, then we can consider ourselves to be like really amazing at that one thing, you know? Yeah. So, like you, flip what, it on you, you there, like well, what you do is sick. What you do is very yeah, we just, niche and specialist, you know? Yeah, alhamdulillah. I mean, that was, that was my background. So mm -hmm. I started off, to give a bit more background on me, like I started off just writing as like a freelancer, um, like blogging for companies, not even necessarily technology companies or software companies at the beginning. And so I just sort of snowballed from there. Like I just sort of found that to be a relatively easy way to earn money, not a huge mm -hmm. amount of money at the beginning, mm -hmm. but... Um, yeah, it just see, it made sense to just like niche down on that and specialize on that. And yeah, alhamdulillah, mm. it's what I've been doing ever since really. Mm. But I'm going to flip it on you, bro. Like mm. I want to get into like the meat of the scheduling, right? I mean, people may, may want to hear about our businesses, but I think the main, main thing here is that how does, how does your day look? How does your average day look as someone who is, mm. you know, how do you want to describe yourself? I don't know. I don't personally describe myself as an entrepreneur, but you know, I don't know how you describe <laughs> yourself, business owner, Entrepreneur, coach, up. mentor, author. <laughs> guru. <laughs> guru. Imagine putting guru in your own profile. Some people do. It's crazy, man. Yeah. But yeah, tell me about your average, you yeah, know, what does yeah, your schedule yeah. look like? So, you know, uh, before, um, when, I, when I was doing the agency done for you services, I was the one like writing, uh, running the ads, manage, monitoring the ads, uh, creating uh, marketing funnels, uh, writing emails. Most of the time, I was not doing the social content. Um, I'm, you know, apparently too much of a robot for that. Although I'm not bad at it, Allah. <laughs> I could do it definitely, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, so that was like uh, pretty much my day to day. I was, uh, you know, I get up in the morning and uh, I'll just, uh, you know, um, yeah. Usually, first thing, I would I would go into the ad accounts and just check everything. Um, you know, might make some changes. Um, but generally, yeah, do that kind of thing. And this was, this was like over six months ago, so I'm trying to remember. Um, then I would just have my, you know, I, I, I use Trello. We use Trello as a company to like have all the tasks there. So for me, it's like um, I don't, I'll wake up in the morning not, know, not knowing really what I'm doing today. But that's fine because it's just all in Trello in the list called mm. to do today. Right. So right. We, either I would have done that last night where I drag the cards into to do today. Or um, in the morning, I would just uh, drag what's you know what seems reasonable mm. to complete in one uh, one day, um, okay. and then and then I might get on with some of that stuff. So it might be email uh, writing an email sequence, which I would do in Google Docs and then put into the email software. It might be uh, what else? Yeah, like it might be briefing a designer to to get some uh, graphics done for uh, ads. Uh, it might be writing new ads. It might be uh, doing some targeting research for ads. It might be, <clears throat> what else did I say? Funnel, it might, it might be like uh, creating the, the funnel, like either designing the pages or like writing the copy, stuff like that. So that would be mm. my day-to-day. -day. Then there was one point where I was doing that work and I was um, like liaising with clients, which I hate. Um, I guess I just, I don't know, I'm not really into talking to people. So no offense to any clients listening. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so... So, uh, there was like a three month period where I was doing that as well. And that was actually smoother in terms of like, um, I understand what is going on and I could just talk to them directly. But the downside is sometimes you spend time on calls and you're like, 
I could be spending this time on your ads, you know, rather than yeah. that. So that was my day to day then. Now it's like, uh, sometimes like who knows, because I, I do sales calls now. So people uh, book uh, calls into our diary. And then whenever they book to call, that's when I'm going to do the call, of course. So I, I try and leave myself quite open so that people have choice of when to book calls. So we yeah. obviously get more calls, right? Um, but then uh, I'm also I'm managing our own ads now. I'm writing email sequences sometimes. Uh, what else do I do? I, I have a lot of miscellaneous jobs. Like So um, I was doing our own content for a few months. I stopped that now. Uh, someone else does that. Um, so I manage the ads. I do sales calls. I guess those are my main things. And then I do miscellaneous stuff like email funnel stuff uh, because we have our own funnel. We have our own emails. Uh, yeah. But on a good day, I just do sales calls because obviously that's good if you're doing those as a sales call. Yeah. MashaAllah, that's good, man. Mm. Let's, um, what about you, though? Tell, tell us a little bit about All right, your, yeah. Let me so. jump into that then. Mm. So my... What I want to do is I want to talk about what I do and then yeah. I want to talk about how, how like our day looks like. Cause I'm, I'm thinking about if people listen to this who are not, who are just like having like a nine to five or yeah. they're thinking about starting some, something like they, they probably want to know, like, do we have like a set bedtime, set time, to wake up? How does that work? That, that kind of stuff mm. work. So we'll talk about that as well. Well, yeah, bro. Well, let me just finish actually. So, uh, when do I finish work? Because I, I try and start mm. work at nine. Um, I used to have dreams of starting at like seven, but I just <laughs> flop at sleeping early. So that's difficult. Same. Um, so I try to always start at nine. Uh, so uh, I might, I might, I, I try and read before I start work because if I don't read before that, I tend to not read at all. Right. So I, I try, I try to prioritize that and then uh, I'll start at nine and I try and finish at like five or six, but usually it just depends when Maghrib is. I try not to work beyond Maghrib. Uh, I, yeah. I just hate working at nighttime, to be honest. So okay. that was my thing. But last, uh, when was it? Uh, Thursday, um, we, we did a webinar with uh, Launch Good, alhamdulillah, like a collaboration thing. And um, because like the main audience was in America, we started uh, the webinar at 1 a.m. here. Oh, wow. So, so, and of course, like we can't just uh, deliver the webinar and leave, right? So the, the actual content of the webinar was like one hour, but then we're just doing Q and A and like, I don't know, we just, we just try to give more, right? So uh, mm. I went to bed at like 4 a.m. that day. So wow. uh, that was just one off, okay. you know, that's why I don't mind yeah, it was yeah. one off, you know? Yeah. Um, a lot of our clients are in America as well. Mm. Um, so I'm used to late night calls and that was the same even when I lived in London. Uh, I'd have calls with one client at 11 p.m. every Thursday. Um, and now I have similar timed calls on Thursdays and Wednesdays as well. So I'm pretty much forced to work late at night sometimes, um, mm. which I don't really mind because I've, I've always been like a night owl in that sense. Um, I'm not very good at sleeping early, not great at waking up early. Um, so, yeah, I've always been sort of somebody who works very casually during the day and then does like two to three hours of, of like solid work at night. That's mm. usually how, how I work. Um, but how does that work with fat. having like wife and kids? Well, it, to be honest, it works better, I think, because I can spend the day sometimes with it. If I'm, if I'm not having a massively busy day, that I can, I can afford to take the morning off and just like chill with mm. them or go out somewhere. Or, right. I can, or, if I, or if I think I don't have meetings tonight, then okay, let me do these two or three hours solid work in a day or, or have much money to work in a day. Mm. And then I can casually work later on after we go out to, for a meal or something like that, right? Yeah. So... So, it, so when you, when you know you have meetings at night, then you consciously will be like, yeah, I'm not working that much in the day. Yeah. Because I may as well get into the main focus mode at night. Right. Cause if I've okay. got a meeting at 11 PM, mm. I've got a meeting at 11 PM, then I may as well like start proper work at like eight and mm. finish at like one, you know? Mm. And like, because sometimes can... for me, like I'll work, I work all day and then I'll realize actually I haven't accomplished enough. So then I'll just work at night and then end up working the whole day. I'm not, I'm not pretending that, that happens much. Yeah, it, does it happens, happen. it happens. It does happen, it does happen. Um, yeah, it, it does happen and it is fluid. It depends on the day, depends on what mm. the schedule looks like that day. Do I have mm. meetings or not have meetings? Mm. Are, they in, are they meetings that I need to prepare for? Because sometimes yeah. you've got a meeting that's like, it's at 11 p.m., mm. but I need to like work, I need to prepare for that meeting, uh, like two hours of work just for that meeting. Right. So that, that changes things a lot. That, mm. that puts more pressure. Mm. Sometimes it's a meeting where you don't have to prepare, mm. it's just like you turn up and talk to somebody. But you get paid for those meetings, isn't it? 
you want most of them most yeah. of them yeah yeah, yeah the ones that so are my you, clients you're it's not my clients. Uh, yeah it's not like accurate to call it a meeting then it's like a consulting session isn't it true that's true yeah it's yeah. not it's not necessarily it's a, it's a mm. consulting session yeah so, yeah just to make you they, like they seem sick and stuff consulting yeah yeah, yeah i consult everybody no it's just they just are clients we meet with them fortnightly or monthly mm. to give them updates and that kind of thing right mm. um but it's a, it's a time for us to like present the work we've been doing mm. so i've got to make sure that we've done enough work you know in these last two weeks here's what we've yeah. done in this last month here's what we've done so that's oh, like is that what you call preparation that. just catching up on everything yeah just catching up the last hour or something no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i just got i gotta make sure it's there presentable it's been delivered to them mm. I, I look through it to make sure it's like a good standard and everything like that right so you just gotta make sure and then you've got to like figure out do i have any questions for them do i need to ask them anything important in this meeting um, is there anything I could give them of extra value? So I like to do some extra research for them and uh, suggest ideas, content ideas, mm. for example, mm. suggest things they could do with their existing content, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So there's 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 preparation needs to go into. Mm. You know, going speaking, back to like the yeah, go on. Yeah, no, go on. Uh, I was going to say, uh, yeah, you know, like our, like we talked a bit about how we work and stuff. Like I said, you know, sometimes I end up working all day and then in the night also have to work because you know just need to like get stuff done, right? Um, yeah, I still think having said that, like, I, that's like kind of rare for me, right? And I'm very aware that I don't work or I don't live the usual uh, business owner lifestyle, right? Or self employed lifestyle. Like, I think the average is working 12 hours a day every day, maybe or six days a week. Mm. This, this is the, the real the reality. And so I'm aware of that, though. And I think why is why is it that I kind of work less than that? I think it's because I, I kind of try to design the business in a way where you don't have to do it like yeah. that. And then also, um, I'm kind of obsessed with efficiency. So I try and do all these things that will cut out, uh, not just like five minutes here and there, but also when you change your attention from one thing to another, you lose flow, isn't it? So I try to avoid any of those kind of, uh, try to like, when I'm working on something, I just like focus on it. Um, and, and I think that's why, but mostly because it's like by design and maybe our types of businesses. Well, I don't know, bro. Like when, when we were more in the agency kind of thing, it, it was difficult. And then when you get a workload, or like a lot of workload, you try to hire people, right? But then sometimes hiring then adds more work of managing people. And then it, yeah. it can get tricky. That's why agency, like beyond five to 10 employees. I think agencies get very difficult to manage, but, but yeah, yeah. that's why I'm just, I'm just very aware that I don't live the, the real like difficult entrepreneur life. Well, this is the thing. I mean, maybe you is, do though. I don't think I do, but th then again, what is, what is the typical mm. or the average mm. work day for a business mm. owner? You know, some mm. business owners, they, they run bakeries where they've got to be up at like 5am to put yeah. the bread in the oven. Exactly. You know I mean, they're up until, and, they, and their shop is open till midnight, you know? So the, you, that's like a mm. 20, you know, 20 hour, like a not 18, 19 hour day for them. Right. Other, you know, we've got services business, uh, which is, you know, comparatively less, you know, mm. physical, actual effort. Mm. And you can um, work can whenever be, you like for the most part. You can work whenever you like. That's right. And you can put, especially because we're working online, you can put, um, you know, um, mechanisms in place and sort of uh, strategies in place that can help you sort of streamline your processes, right? So you can actually hire people. You can automate things using certain softwares, mm. so on and so forth, to the point where, you know, you're, you're not sort of overexerting yourself. Yeah. But, you know, I still, I still put in, I don't know how many hours I put in in a day. I don't really measure it, to be honest. Some, some mm. every day is different. You know, I'd mm. say, on if I had to put like an average hour, mm. I don't know, maybe maybe six hours, to be honest. I mean, I don't mm. know. It, it just depends on the day. And it, it also depends, depends how you beginning. measure it because uh, some people would mm. measure when they're sitting at the desk, and other people yeah. would measure when they're actually doing work. And I find there's, right. a, there's a 20 to 50% difference between those two kind of things, yeah. you know, like it's true. I'm always sitting at my desk, I don't know, eight hours, nine hours, whatever. But yeah. what I started doing last few months is actually measuring when I'm working. So I have, mm. I use, uh, what's it called? A toggle. Maybe you've heard of it um, yeah. to, to measure my hours. Usually people use this to like measure, okay, this remote guy, how many hours is he working? But I do it for myself, right? Because I, I believe that uh, if you're efficient, uh, like if you're, you're focused, you're, you're, you know what you're doing, you're organized, then five to six hours a day should be enough for you to 
yeah. get a lot done, right? Um, yeah. So that so I measure myself for that reason to say, okay, I've got a goal of how many hours I put in, and I just want to know, like, obviously, if you don't measure it, you you don't you have no idea. So I started doing that. Yeah. But what it made me do as well is when I click record this time, yeah, it makes me actually work and not get distracted, you know. Yeah. So I found that benefit. I may use that. That sounds like a good idea. Actually, recording when I work. Cause that, cause, cause like I just said, like, I just tried to figure out how much do I actually work? And I was thinking actual work. Yeah. Not just sitting in front of a laptop, actual, you know, doing the actual work. And I don't know, I've got no clue. So maybe mm. that's a good way for me to sort of check how much actual work I'm doing. Yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think I always think, you know, am I working more than the average person or less than the average person? Cause in mm. my mind, I'm always thinking about the business really like obviously not every sec second, but most of the time I, my mind goes to, you know, or how, you know, this client we've got to do this meeting for this client tomorrow, or how can I get more, more clients? How can I do this? How can I do that? Oh, this, this person's causing me issues. That's causing me issues. So there's always things going on in my head. Yeah. And I don't know if that's the case for people with like a nine to five mm. all the time. Right. Cause maybe they come home and that there's switch pretty off. much done. Mm. They switch off. Maybe, Unless, but maybe not. I, maybe I, I'm, yeah. I can understand how people would keep thinking about it. Especially I yeah. always hear, I always read these articles about, or, people are checking their email when they're, you know, home from work and all of that. Yeah. That's just maybe a self-discipline issue or maybe it's also is, an expectation uh, that you would yeah. be checking the email. Yeah. And then at the same time, it's kind of like, you know, from a legal perspective, your boss can't force you to work outside your working hours. Technically. I know that that does happen. And you know, people often stay, stay, stay late and they have yeah. to do extra tasks, things like that. I know it happens, mm. but technically speaking, Mm. You don't have to do the work at like 11 p.m. You know, if your boss sends you, sends you an emergency email at 11 p.m., you're quite you're in your right to say, mm, "I'll mm. check that at 7 a.m." You know what I mean? Mm. And that's and leave it at that. But with me, if I get an emergency email at 11 p.m. that something's wrong or something like that, then it's going to be a late yeah. night. You know, yeah. or, I'm, I'm, or I'm not sleeping at night. You know, and that's yeah. you got you got to handle it. Mm. And that's, that's another the price thing. You pay, like, isn't it? That's right. And this is another thing I want. I hope we can touch on in this podcast is like not just the hours that you put in, but like the life, like the difference in lifestyle that you do have when you own a business. And I think we mentioned like talking about this topic before to talk about, you know, should everyone have a business? Should everybody start a business? Is it, is it a lifestyle that everybody should aspire to have? Yeah. So what do you think before I start mm. rambling? What do you mm. think? Do you think, do you think that kind of lifestyle is for everybody or they should try it or, or do they have like an, innate, an innate need to do that? I don't think it's for everybody and I don't think everyone should have a need to do it. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's really good. Like a lot, like maybe more than half, right? Um, and yeah. I kind of half get that from my assumption that in the past people, like throughout humanity's history, uh, most people were self-employed. This is what, my, what I'm aware of at least. Uh, because even, you know, mm -hmm. if you think of a, you know, a poor farmer, they might have got capital from someone else, but ultimately they're left to do the farming, right? And they had, you know, they had a, a fire behind them because if they don't get the harvest, they don't eat, right? So um, a blacksmith, farmer, um, even like nomads who need to either gather food or hunt or whatever, it's all like self-directed stuff you know, and it's all, yeah. and also because there was less abundance before. So most people were pro probably, you remember, might remember this word from a uh, geography, like GCSE, uh, sub, not subservient, subsistence farmers. So they're just farming okay. to feed themselves, right? right? They don't generally have like extra. Um, okay. So mo I think most people were living that kind of lifestyle before. So they're, and they're working for themselves. Like I said, blacksmith work for himself, farmer work for mm. himself, uh, trading work for yourself. You may have some other capital involved uh, to pay for yeah. stock or to pay, but I feel like it, even then you're self-employed, right? It's, it's the typical founder investor relationship. Um, mm. Whereas like the, I, I think just the, the nine to five concept seems to be a more like, 150 200 year old thing so because of that it makes me think we we can all do it um but maybe we're not all suited to do it especially since we've had now over 100 years of um you know just being uh, raised and it, it being built into our culture to kind of be employees you know what i mean and it, that's a mindset you know being an yeah. employee is a mindset so um that's why i don't mm. i don't really think it's best suited for everyone 
Um, but yeah. having said that, like in Islam, I think it's good to be independent of need of others. So that's good. It's good. And when you have a successful business, you have more power, you have influence, even if it's only over your own timetable to an extent and your employees, like what your employees, how they behave uh, and that kind of thing. You have that kind of uh, you know power. So I think it's good for Muslims to get that. And that's why I think, yeah, Andy, it's worth trying it out. But ju- if it yeah. doesn't work out, and like obviously most businesses don't work out stuff, but yeah, and he, it doesn't mean everyone can do it. That's what, you know, that's what I think. Yeah. And maybe you comment on it, then I'll come in because there are certain traits I think you just need to have and not everyone's going to have them. Yeah, man. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned like the historical, you know, context that most people would have been self-employed previously. I don't know if it's most people, but probably, like, yeah, probably just over 50% or something like that would have been having their own sort of small business just to look after their families. But um, in terms of like modern day, it's definitely not possible for everybody to have their own business. Firstly, like the, the economy would collapse if everybody had their own business. Everyone needs to hire somebody at some stage. So we definitely need employees. We definitely need people who are not just- Don't want wi- to be quote, unquote, unquote. Yeah. yeah, they don't want to be. They're not, they're not willing to work as employees. They want to, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, you know, I don't know who said it. I think it maybe Gary Vaynerchuk that says it like the number two or the number five or number 17 at Facebook would earn far more than most entrepreneurs ever would, you know? So there's nothing necessarily wrong, even from a financial perspective, being an employee somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be at Facebook, it could be at any company. Mm-hmm. And you may earn more money that way and you may prefer that, mm-hmm. you know? So well, I know for a fact, like, if I had a job right now, I'd be earning more than I'm earning now. I'm very sure. Yeah, and that, but this, this, I'm going to get to this as well because it's not all about the money, right? Mm. So what was, where was I? Um, number 17 at Facebook. <laughs> Number 17 of Facebook, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's the, that's the thing. Some people prefer, you know, having their day dictated for them. You know, their, bo- yeah. their boss tells them, look, you need to come in at 9 a.m. Uh, you need to do X, Y, Z task until mm. 6 p.m. And I'm going to be behind you with a whip to make sure you do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, they don't, maybe they don't like that part or, you know, they subconsciously mm. or yeah. they consciously don't <clears throat> like that part. But subconsciously, they, they prefer to have that environment. Yeah, mm. they need it. Or they prefer to have that kind of environment where, you know, somebody else, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's their knock on, neck on the line and not mine. It's their business, not mine. I'm just here to provide a service, mm. provide, you know, <laughs> provide my service and go home, you know? Yeah. And people, people like that as well. And I think that's fine. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I do think everybody should try to start a business, right? Even everyone. though, as you mentioned as well, everyone should try to start a business. Um, mm. Even if you don't think you have the traits that are required, because, um, well, what you mentioned as well, not every business is going to last or, or, or take off. That's fine. But if, you, if, if your business does take off, right, and, you, and you know, our lives are better planners, maybe your business does take off, even though you're not really a business person or a business man or business woman, right? But you're, the, the idea that you have just takes off and, you know, you just, it just goes and you don't even have to do much to it. And that's, that's quite possible. So th- there's, that, there's that perspective. Plus the whole, you know, having additional freedom, having all the stuff you mentioned just now, the additional freedom, the additional power to choose to sort of unplug yourself from a, from the from society system and have your own mm. system, right? Yeah. Which allows you to do so much more. It allows you to pray your salat, the masjid, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're obligated to do so. Go to Juma without having to worry about, is our boss going to allow me to do it this week or not? Or job interview, would they allow me to do that? Going to Hajj becomes a lot easier, for example. Um, all these different things, right? Like mm. Ramadan will become a lot easier for you, for example. You can, you can prioritize things that need to be prioritized rather yeah. than having to worry about fitting in and conforming to the system mm. so that alone mm. money aside that alone as, as muslims that is really 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 beneficial beneficial mm. and i would say even if you were to earn less money with a business you know put the financial side put, put the finances to the side for a second maybe that additional flexibility you know to have your money coming in online for example or coming in from a different from a way that you could move around as well again maybe you could move to a muslim country all this flexibility is worth taking home yeah Ten thousand pounds less, mm. you know, or twenty thousand pounds less. Mm. Maybe it is, and mm. I don't think anybody's going to figure that out until they try to launch a business or try to launch something. And even if you've got a full-time job, like you can spend two hours a day, one hour a day, trying to launch something, trying to do something, you know, monetizing your existing hobby. You know, it's not necessarily something that's got to be difficult. Um, I think a lot of the time people overcomplicate business as well and, and they make it out to be something really difficult. <laughs> like you and me, we're not, uh, we're not geniuses. We're not, we haven't figured out some sort of 
secret code. Uh, it's just like you just start something and if Allah's written for it to be successful, then it can be successful. You know, it will be successful. Mm. And that's, and, but you won't know that until you actually try it. You know, I don't so, agree, bro. I think business okay. is very hard. No, no, business is hard. What I'm saying is to start a business, the, the, actual, the actual mechanisms around starting a business is not difficult. Right? Uh, Running starting, a business long-term yeah. is difficult. Everyone likes starting a business, bro. Get the business cars, get a logo, all of that <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, bro, I, because I'm now like training people on marketing, um, yeah. I, I, and I do sales calls. I talk to people who come to me. They say, my biggest problem in my business is marketing. Okay. They say it. Mm. Then mm. when I tell them, okay, I can train you. You can actually become really good at marketing. Then they say, oh no, I don't want to do that. And then yeah. I'm like, what, why not? They're like, oh, you know, I don't have time and this and that. I'm like, okay, but you can't hire someone. You can't afford to hire someone. And you don't want to do it. And I think the yeah. reason I thought a lot about this, why are people so happy to make products or to work on their service or to work on their brand or whatever? It's because it's easy, bro. Like if you don't have customers or you have very few customers and you make a, a product, you've got no one telling you it's rubbish, right? Mm. But when you do marketing, you, that's, the, the, that's like judgment day, if you know what I mean. That's when pe the market will give you feedback on, on your thing and most of the time it will be negative feedback, meaning not meaning that they're going to say bad things about you, but they're not going to buy. Right. So like yeah. uh, an e-commerce website, a good conversion rate on an e-commerce website is like 3%. So out of a hundred people visiting your website, three will buy. Right. So that's yeah. 97 people saying, no, not for me. So that's why I think people, they avoid marketing because I think marketing is the true business. Marketing is business mm. because, yeah. um, Selling, isn't it? Like selling is business. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, to touch on what you disagree on, I do agree with you that, you know, running a business and, and getting past these obstacles, right? Where, you, okay, you've got your business card, you've got your website, you've done all that. And now you actually you're going to market. That's a time where it's either going to work or it's not going to work, right? You've either done, done it correctly or you haven't done it correctly, or you haven't got those traits. You do need certain traits to sort of overcome obstacles, learn new things, do, do, do new things, right? And it may not work. And for most people, it probably won't work, right? If, it's, if I'm talking about everybody starting something, most of, most of those businesses are going to fail, probably around that stage where it starts to get hard. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. But what I'm just saying is that everybody should at least get to that stage where they can test mm -hmm. themselves, have something, whether it's, you know, selling cupcakes online or doing a service like you and me do social media management, wherever it needs to be and getting it to that stage and figuring out for themselves, is this something that I can do? Is this something I want to do? Because the benefits are quite good. Like Islamically, the benefits are quite good. Like we just mentioned. Um, and I think it will be a shame if you just don't try to get to that stage. Will you become the next Amazon? Probably not. Um, will you become, will you make enough money to sort of live off it for the rest of your life? Don't know. Who knows? Maybe. A large best of planners, but you've got to try to get there. Mm. And if you don't, if you just stay within the system, then you're always going to be in the system. And what a shame if you stay in that system for 50 years and you never even try to to change it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, Most people yeah. won't be able to get out of it, but just try. Mm. And you never know. And mm. uh, there's a there's a lot of people out there who started businesses, and they weren't good business people, right? They did start businesses, but the product was so good, mm. or the service was so innovative, mm. or whatever it may have been, that it just took off even without them ever really doing anything. And they just outsource the whole thing, you know, and yeah. they just become, they pretty You're much right. become rich. Or sometimes you know? the so initial sales are enough to hire someone who is good at that stuff. Like exactly. for example, operations. Exactly. Yeah. Like, uh, like yeah. Mark Zuckerberg, he's like a geek. Um, I don't think he's much of a salesperson. He's not charismatic. He had a good idea. He was ruthless. Let's be real. And, yeah. um, I guess he knows the technical side of things because he was, I don't know, a computer science or something at Harvard or whatever, right? But hmm. what transformed Facebook, like he, he, he did very well without her, but what transformed Facebook was Sheryl Sandberg came on, COO. She's the one that really made it a real like business business, you know, like yeah. hundreds of billions or whatever. So uh, he was able yeah. to do that. He obviously had investors. He had all of that help. Um, but yeah. the point is that he can't do what she does. You know, she does the operations. Mm. She monetized things very well and all of that. So yeah, uh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to just sort of, 
you know, make it oh, Facebook or bust. Yeah. Oh, start a new Facebook or, you know, just stay in the system. It doesn't have to mm. be that. You could just mm. be something that you can do that yeah. brings in 30,000 pounds or $40,000 a year. And that, and that gives you a real choice, you know, because firstly, that's pretty much what everyone's earning anyway. Most, the average, I believe, in the UK is like 30, 35 or 30. And it's um, actually 28 and or something, man. Yeah, you're right, actually. It's a bit lower than 30. So that, there's that, right? And also, there's also the fact that even if you're earning more than that, your day job, you've now got, the, you've now got like um, a small business that is going to pay you, you know, almost as much, but give you all that additional flexibility and allow you mm. to do all those things we mentioned. Oh, bro, so what about businesses that are not like ours? Like we have flexibility, um, mm. but then like, I think, bro, a lot of people, I don't know, maybe the next generation is different, but a lot of people, their dream is like, I want a cafe, you know, I want yeah. uh, to sell like gift boxes. I want to sell abayas, whatever. Um, yeah. These are different types of businesses, which may not have as much flexibility, you know? Um, but that's why I just think somebody analyzing it from the ben the benefit I will get for myself, someone thinking of it purely from that angle, they might not start it. Uh, but I think sometimes it just takes someone incredibly passionate and someone has the work ethic. They just get started. They get some initial success. And before they know it, they're like, they're, they're, they're doing it like, and th th there's yeah. no backing down. And it's like, yeah. okay, like. Basically, ask any business person, even very successful people, if you knew you had to do this level of work to get where you are now, would you have started? Most would say no. Like I wouldn't have started it, right? Mm. Uh, but it's just some, some uh, irrational passion or work ethic or obsession yeah. that really get, you know, gets them going. Yeah. And I think now is a good time to sort of segue into what traits do you need? Yeah. Yeah. And for me personally, I, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm still undecided on are you born a business owner or can it be learned or is it something you can transition into? Mm. Um, because there are a lot of business owners who worked um, like very successful entrepreneurs out there who worked for like 30 years in a corporate office and then they, then they open a business and then they're mad successful now that, yeah. that exists. So, so there's that. But for me personally, like I, I grew up, maybe it's cause my dad was a business, is a business owner as well. But I grew up like wanting to own a business, wanting to work on my own terms and the thought of, working for somebody else for any prolonged period of time was like suffocating to me. Like I couldn't, mm. I didn't want to do that. Like I did there's no way I, I just always thought, no, it's not for me right from the get go from a very mm. young age. So I don't know. Is that yeah. a trait? Is that something I learned from my dad? I don't know. But, um, what do you think? What do you I think? think is that a lot of business people have that thing of, I don't want to work for someone, but I don't think everyone, like I, I, yeah. I can work for someone. Yeah. I don't mind. Um, I don't mind that. Um, but I, I would think, if I have to. I yeah. just really wouldn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. No, what I mean is uh, my motivation for having a business was not really to not work for someone. Uh, mm. my, my motivation was more, I don't know, um, to be in control of my schedule, to eventually be able to spend more time with my family than I would if I had a job. Um, I guess flexibility, you know, is a big one. Uh, especially with the kind of online based business where you can kind of live anywhere and all of that. Uh, that was, I think my main motivation. It wasn't a ton of cash. It wasn't, um, it was just, it wasn't like, I don't have to, I don't have to answer to anyone. Right. Cause anyway, you kind of have to answer to clients anyway, but, yeah. um, not hundred percent. Of course you can, you can also fire clients, but, um, mm. But ultimately, I think it was the, the flexibility side of things. And until today, if, if I think about it, uh, the flexibility is what I really enjoy. Um, so a lot of people do it for that reason. They don't want to answer to anyone. Um, that's fine. Uh, I think when it comes to traits, you're not born with them, right? Uh, what the traits I'm going to talk about. But you, by, by age like 25, you either have them or you don't. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, because yeah. It, it's not so much in your genes, but it's in your upbringing. <clears throat> so if by age 25, you don't have, I, I, I just thought of like three main uh, kind of uh, traits that you need. And these are the same traits that would make you an amazing number 17 at Facebook yeah, as well. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's the same thing. Um, there's just a certain, I think the only difference between, people have these traits and they either have a job or have a business is just literally wanting to like, you know? So, um, I think number one is work ethic. Okay. You need uh, incredible work ethic. You need to be 
you need to have no sense of entitlement whatsoever. Like this task shouldn't take this long. You know, there's no such thing as that in mm. business. It just takes that long, do it or not, you know, do it or just die, just give up, you know? So work <laughs> ethic uh, is a big one. Uh, and again, like if you don't have work ethic by age 25, I, I, I'm sorry. Like, I think you missed the, missed the bus on that. You know? you're, not, you're not going to be number 17. You're going to be, <laughs> yeah, you're going to be, yeah? you're going to be like everyone else who, as we know, as people who've employed people, most people are mediocre. You know, the, you have to, um, you have to really controversial, controversial. I mean, no, it's not controversial. <laughs> man. I don't think so. I think I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm yeah, kidding. yeah. Any employee, uh, any employer knows the average person is quite me, quite mediocre, um, and is a pain to employ. Yeah, everyone knows that. Yeah, um, but. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that's number one work ethic. Uh, number two, I would say is uh, being proactive and taking initiative, right? So not just saying like, this is my job. And uh, I did my role like, like, but in business, there's no role, right? You just have to make the business work. So you have to yeah. be, be willing to go beyond different things, whether it's where you, you're working with a client, you give extra value, you do extra thing. Or you see a client is shaking and they might be leaving you soon. So you do, you proactively do something extra to kind of make them feel like there's more value there and stuff. So mm. uh, taking initiative, being proactive, um, you need that. That's absolutely needed as well. The third thing, um, hmm, what was I going to say? The third one. Huh. I think it, I think it will come back in Charlotte. Slip your mind. Yeah. Inshallah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, work ethic is obvi the obvious one, but I think the, the other thing you touched on was interesting, which is like no, no entitlement, not having any entitlement. Right. Mm. And I think maybe that, that breaks more business owners than, than uh, they would care to admit, which is like, they weren't willing to do, because at the very beginning, you've got to do everything. Like we're talking now, our businesses, alhamdulillah, are a bit more established. We're definitely not Facebook level, but we're a little bit more established where we've got people who can, who can lean on to do certain things. But at the very beginning, you've got to do all the, the legwork, all the dirty work. Yeah. Uh, you've got to wear multiple hats. You've got to work late nights, um, early mornings sometimes. Like at the very beginning, you've got to do everything. And when you get that first client, you've got to make sure all the value is there, plus additional value, so on and so forth. You've got to really work like a dog, really, the first, mm. the first you know, opening stage of any business. Mm. And I think a lot of people, if they're coming from a, a place where they have already had a nine to five, they're not used to working that hard, quite frankly. They're not used to sort of really feeling that their neck is on the line and that if they don't do this, then they're, they're dead in the water, right? Um, is that, that feeling isn't necessarily um, you know, familiar to them unless, unless they're in a, in, a, in a position where they were going to be fired or something like that. Maybe they have, have a similar feeling. But generally speaking, they don't have that sort of everyday fear or everyday sort of fire yeah. underneath them to, to motivate them like that. Uh, and if they don't have that fire underneath them in a, in a business sense, then they'll just, they will just give up. And that's a, that's a stage where they'll just say, Oh, it's too difficult. And now they'll start to make excuses at that point where, you know, the, the market does, is not right or the market fit isn't there or something's not right. And they'll just stop because they just don't want, they want to, they want to put that hard, hard work in because they do have entitlement. They do have that, you know, They've been, they've been nurtured to, to, to fit into the system, right? And to, to, to launch your own business is to go against the system and to sort of jam your idea into the system by force, basically. That's what, that's what building a, system, uh, a business is, to jam your thing into the system by force and make it work and make other people like that and use it and pay you money to, to use that product or service. That's pretty much mm -hmm. what business is. So yeah. if you're not willing to go against a system like that, then it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought of the third trait, which is attention to detail. Hmm. If you I'll if you don't have attention to detail, sense. yeah. If you don't have attention to detail, you're not going to be able to be proactive in the first place because you're not going to notice the uh op the opportunities to be proactive, right? Um, also, you're just going to be that like dopey manager when you're managing people. You got to be <laughs> like on point, like you. You you don't have to be uh, as skilled as every employee that you have, yeah. but you kind of have to be on the ball more than anyone else. Yeah, you know, and part of being That's on the ball is attention to detail. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I agree with you on this hundred percent because I know plenty of business. I, I wouldn't say 
me personally, do I have a fantastic attention to detail? I'm okay. I would consider it one of my, one of my strongest points. Um, and I know other business owners who have got terrible attention to detail. They never look at the details of anything. Mm. Uh, they're, they're all, they're totally focused on like the, the, you know, the lot, the bigger picture. I don't really look at the smaller details They don't micromanage anything. Uh, and they just like hope for the results to come through. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to work like that, but I've seen them have success with that. You know, I've seen them just focus on the bigger picture, leave the details to an employee and um, it works for them. Uh, it's not going to work for every business, but it does work. So I don't know if that's a prerequisite to being a business owner. I think it helps, but not a prerequisite. How can you have a good service or product unless you're kind of into the details? You're, it's not that you have to be working in the details, right? Like, yeah. like Tim Cook. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I thought this was an iPhone. Here's an iPhone. Uh, <laughs> Tim Cook, yeah. Uh, do you, d did he work on the details of this? You know, No, he didn't. Uh, he had people who were doing that. But he's still able, he's got the attention to detail to pick up on things because the amount of attention to detail to make this as sick as it is, is incredible. It's immense. And it's not just the fact they have, you know, tens of thousands of employees or actually hundreds of thousands maybe. All right. It's not just that. It's, it's from the management level all the way down. It's like attention to detail. Of course, there's plenty of yeah. mediocre people in Apple, but that's, and, and I give the example of Apple, um, but it's like it applies to every business. Like. Uh, for example, I was working before on this uh, with this uh, e-commerce brand and the, the, the kind of founder of that, he, he had, he actually had, he, he had a few traits um, who, that were not what we talk about, these three things, but um, in terms of product, he had crazy attention to detail and that's the only way the product became attractive enough to buy, you know what I mean? So yeah, I think uh, those guys mm -hmm. you're mentioning, um, I'm assuming they're doing well, right? Yeah. 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 So they're and doing well. Um, maybe it's because they, they're firstly, they're always exceptions to the rule. And secondly, yeah. yeah, maybe they kind of got successful enough by themselves that they could hire someone who has incredible attention to detail. Yeah. You see, I think there's some, I think there's some business types that require less attention to detail. So for example, Perhaps, buying yeah. and selling, buying and selling, uh, although you need to sell um, something, you're, you, you need to be aware of what you're selling. You need to have good knowledge of the product you're selling. Mm. I think if you're if you're if you're planning to start a, a buying and selling business, exporting, mm. importing, I think I don't think attention to detail is necessarily where you want to be focusing on the, your, your attention most. It's more like spotting trends in the market, uh, spotting gaps in the market, uh, being mm. able to negotiate uh, good uh, good deals and, you know, buy, buy low and sell high. Right. So there's a lot of companies that do that. Right. And they're not really worried about the details. They buy and sell tea, mm. but, but the only thing they know about a tea is that, that it comes from Sri Lanka and mm. the delivery is on Monday at 7 PM. And then yeah. we're going to sell it to Tesco. When, you know, that's what it, and they're just constantly thinking about where we're buying it from, where we're selling it from, what's the yeah. price, what's this, what's that? How can we push this? How can yeah. we push that supplier? They don't worry about details. So that, mm. that's what I'm trying to get at where yeah, yeah. there are some business types where it's like, you know what? They're just purely focused on the number, the, not even the numbers, like the, 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 the macro numbers. The process, and they're basically. Just like, yeah, they're trying to sort of build that process and they're, they're mm. obsessed with building that process. Yeah. And, and um, they're not necessarily worried about, you know, mm. what kind of, what, is it Ceylon tea or is it Jasmine tea? They're not worried about that. They're worried about, no, you know, Tesco wants tea. Mm. I'm going to buy tea cheap and sell it to them at a decent price. Yeah. And I'm going to outdo my competitors. Mm. And there's, there's room for that as well. So I just yeah, want to yeah. make sure that That's people... That's true, I think. There are, there are quite a lot of exceptions when it comes to this trait, probably. Uh, mm. However, with that example you gave, it's a good example where, yeah, they're not, maybe they don't need to pay as much attention to detail, but they're also like ripe for disruption because of it, right? Yeah. So because yeah, yeah. they're a commodity, ultimately. And you never want to be in a commodity business, really. So, uh, yeah. sucks to be them. So, if if the Uber of tea comes, they're, they're finished, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, there are many. There are many like kind of what if you want to call them old school businesses. They're doing fine now, bro. I I see yeah. I see examples every day. If I do go out, I haven't been out for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, every time I go out, I'm gonna see an example of a business that is textbook rubbish, but doing well. Yeah. Mm. And I think the reason that happens is because maybe of a less competitive market or maybe because they've 
uh, been established for a while. And so that's why they're all right. But when it comes to starting yeah. something new in a, in a you know, decently competitive market, then you absolutely need to be on point. Like I'm talking about marketing wise. Like I see yeah. the biggest marketing crimes, but they're still doing all right for now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. And, you know, end of the day, every, everybody's risk is written by a lot. You know, sometimes there, there's been many people who, who don't work as hard or as, or as smart as you and me who mm. have made 10 times more money than us or whatever, whatever making our lives. Yeah. There's people who've worked far, far, far less and far dumber than mm. you and I who've earned far, far more money as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And similarly, yeah. there's people who've worked so hard and work and, and mm. earn very little money or mm. earn no money and the business, all their businesses failed, but they worked yeah. much far, harder and much smarter than us. Yeah. So there's that element as well, where mm. it's, you know, it's whatever's written to. How do you think of like, that that kind of thing right like for example remember i told you to get rich like a couple of years ago maybe a <laughs> yeah, year yeah. a year You're ago still maybe. working on it man yeah still yeah working on it. <laughs> so um alhamdulillah we're rich but uh alhamdulillah. in terms of growth right so obviously everyone wants to grow and you know i'm always trying to grow and all of that um and uh, you know there is the element of if i put more effort i should grow more right but mm. But sometimes that's a bit of a hamster wheel because you could be working, working, working and putting in more work, trying to work smarter, trying to, you know, learn the, the most cutting edge techniques, let's say marketing, sales techniques, whatever. And you still don't grow. Right. And it's like what you said, like it's just written. And so for that reason, I've come to a conclusion where it's like, it's kind of like what I said, if I'm working like actual focused five to six hours a day and I'm working on the right things, that's the most important thing. Like I'm, I'm putting my effort towards things which um from from everything i know it should have a good impact um then what can i do beyond that right i i mm. do not really believe unless it's like a clear thing like the <coughs> webinar i had to do the other day uh, it, you just have to do those extra hours right but unless uh, yeah I, I i don't think that starting to put in you know 10 hours a day is going to like change things per se right work good hours be focused mm. and do the yeah. right things you should get there okay with some exceptions um and if i was to have the mindset of no just more hours more hours i'd be neglecting my family maybe i'd be neglecting a yeah. better i'd be neglecting other contributions i could make to the world and maybe allah didn't just just didn't write that my risk increases you know so how do you deal with that like this concept mm. that's written and interesting stuff? That's very interesting, man. Um, first and foremost, you do have to start every business every day knowing that it's all written and, and your actions are not, are not going to bring the risk. Like your actions, are, like any success you have is not from you. Um, it's from Allah. So you got to understand that. And I think that takes a little bit of pressure off as well, where it's like, I've just got to do the best that I can in the situation I'm in. Mm. So you just mentioned there, like working 10 hours a day. When I was like single, before I was married and like those responsibilities, I could maybe do that. Um, maybe I was paying more PS4 than I should have done, but I technically could have done that. And um, some days I did do that. Um, and if you're in that situation where you, you're not married and you're, you haven't got so much responsibility, you should do that, right? And you should work 10 hours a day to, to, to launch something, right? But as you get older and you get more responsibilities, that won't be possible anymore because you need to balance your life. You need to spend time with your family, so on and so forth, right? Mm. So Elon Musk wouldn't agree. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But Elon Musk is a, is a weirdo in yeah. a good sense. Um, but yeah, for the average person, you need to sort of take your, your circumstance into account and figure out, okay, I can realistically work six hours a day. Here's what I should do. And you make those six hours work the best you can. Um, so, so there's that perspective. There's that angle to it. The other angle is like, you know, okay, I'm working six hours a day. I'm working really hard. I'm working hard for six months, but I'm not seeing any improvement. Like we're not growing or we're, or we're shrinking, you know, we're losing clients and what do I do? Like, I'm, should I give up? End of the day, again, you, you go back to, it's all, it's all from Allah and it's written. And as long as you're doing your part, you then shouldn't be too hard on yourself. I don't think. Mm. The only time I'm hard on myself is if I know I didn't do enough. Yeah, of course. That's what I'm hard on myself. Yeah. If, yeah. I, if, I've been, if, if I lose a client and I look back over the last six months and I think I've been slacking, mm. I wasn't working as hard. I was taking time off more than I should have done and, and we lost a client. Then, then I'm disappointed and then I'm upset. Yeah. And that, but I use that to fuel myself to, to work harder from that point, right? 
Yeah. But if I did everything I could, if I, if I look back over the last six months, 12 months, I think, you know what, I was working quite well, we were delivering good amount of quality, good amount of quality content, so on and so forth. I just say, you know, it, it, it was cut out a lot anyway, uh, whether I was working hard or not. But, it, it, but at least at that stage, I can say I did everything and it just wasn't written. And I can be mm. a lot more relaxed at that stage. Yeah. And I can definitely. just say, you know, I can take the benefits from it and I can actually use mm. it as a positive. Yeah. yeah. So and I think that almost gives you a reason to like, to start a business, I suppose, because it's like, Obviously, Allah has written certain rules into the world where it's like uh, risk. This is risky. That is less risky. Uh, if you do this, this generally happens like that all exists. Um, yeah. And you, you, that reliably will continue to happen, those rules. Right. But um, it's like if you if you got a certain amount of money written, um, then whether you do a job or you start a business, you know, in theory, it's the same. You know, um, of course, it might change a little bit. It might be, for example, for two years, you're not earning that much, but then the third year, you're earning more than if you had a job and all of that. So, yeah, you know, it's like that. And this is what I mean, bro, by business being hard. Yeah, I'll give you a good example. So, um, let's say, uh, how how could what example could I give? Um, okay, let's say uh, on your pe- people, everyone knows like e-commerce. Yeah, like buying a physical product on a website. Okay. Let's say the description or the photos, let's say the photos, the photos of that product uh, with those photos that you have put there, um, you're getting, you know, uh, 1% of people to buy. Okay. 1% of people that hit the page, they buy. Mm -hmm. Um, Now you might think I need 3%. Okay. So you might start thinking like I need to um, change the pictures. Okay. But if you didn't get enough people to that page, then you don't actually know if that 1% is a true 1%. Okay. Yeah. So then you start thinking, <clears throat> okay, um, it could actually be 5%, but I don't know because I haven't got enough traffic. Yeah. And so you can't do anything at that point. You can't change the photos because the photos might actually be fine. Uh, and, then, and then you're struggling to get traffic. So you can't, you can't like do much either way. Yeah. <laughs> And this yeah, is, yeah. this is the reality. Like, for example, with us, um, let's say on our sales calls, uh, we want uh, 20% of people to buy. Okay. And let's say right now it's 10%. If we do like five calls and the, con- the close rate is 10%, is that a reflection of the script or is it a reflection of those just five people that, that happen to come? We have to do maybe 20 sales calls before we know the true rate. Then we make a change to our approach. Yeah, maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Then we could make a change to the script or or how we approach the sales call. And they have to wait another 30 sales calls to know if that made it go up or maybe it made it go down even. Yeah. So this is the difficulty, man, because sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of the time you're going blind. You're making decisions blind. And that's the difficulty because sometimes you make a decision as well and you need to wait six months you need to make wait wait one year to see if it pays off you know like like i said we changed from an agency to where we were getting paid every month yeah like we had recurring revenue where people are paying us a good amount every month and we switched it to now training people yeah now it's been six to nine months since we made that change is it a good decision is it bad i still don't know like I still don't know. So yeah, that's life, man. This is the thing. I mean, so you're saying that with a smile on your face, you're smiling right now because you don't mind that answer. And if anything, you actually quite like the, is it going to work? Is it, it's a bit of a risky game. It's a bit of mm. like, and it's like, um, it's like playing, it's like playing a game almost, you know, it's like, obviously it's more serious than that because it's your, it's your, it's our money you're dealing with and our livelihood and supporting our family. But it's, it's, I think this is another trait that you need to have, which is like some people will listen to what you just said and they're just they're pulling their hair out. Like, how do you live like that? How do you live knowing, not knowing mm. how can you make a decision and it might ruin your business, your families, you know, and they'll, they'll be like, well, I'll never launch a business now. But other people will be like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. That sounds like, mm. it sounds alive. Yeah. It sounds alive. You know, it makes mm. you feel alive to do that. You know? Yeah, and yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I think you need that as a, as yeah. a, as a business owner. That's you need true. to be able to make those decision, decisions and not necessarily know if it's going to work and enjoy it. Mm. Enjoy the fact that you don't know it's going to work and mm. you can enjoy tweaking it, enjoy doing things almost like a game. 
and seeing you, am, I, am I going to win the, this, this particular game or not? You know, and it's um, it's fun for some people. That's fun for some people. That's a terrifying thing. They yeah. want the stability. They want to know if I come in at nine a.m. and leave at six p.m. I'm going to get the mm. the wage at the end of the month, and mm. that's all they want. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think mm. one trait is whatever that is. What I just described, you need yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. if it's risk taking. I don't know if it's like gaming mm. or what. But mm. You need whatever that was that you just you just described, and yeah. the fact that you smiled as you said it, you need to smile as you say that. Otherwise, yeah, it's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not for you, man. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. true. It's very and true. and yeah. having said that, like you're running blind, like you said though, if if you're Muslim, it helps with that because you're like, yeah, I made 100%. a decision based on like what I know. Yeah, there are plenty of things I don't know. Um, I'm just making decisions here and there, and Allah will guide me to whatever's best. As the the yeah. more I get closer to the him to him, the more he'll guide me, the more he'll put barakah in my money, so that even though I'm earning little, I might go a longer way and all this stuff. So, as with everything in life, being Muslim helps, right? Yeah, and, um, of course. And you know, a lot of people maybe they have uh, I don't know, man. I I see a lot of Muslims, for example, Muslims jumping on the whatever you want to call it, you know, like the whole uh, Corbyn, uh, Jeremy Corbyn vibe, yeah, like being r- rich is bad and I, I'm sick of that, bro. I don't like that. It's like, um, it's not Islamic. Rich, That's yeah. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm rich according to the Prophet Sallam's definition, but awesome. not not according to Corbyn's definition. Um, yeah. So the the reason I'm, I don't like it is because it's not Islamic whatsoever, right? Yeah, and really. um, it it just doesn't make any sense either because uh, business people like make the world go round. Now he's saying that. Uh, it's only the big, big people and stuff. But when, when you scare the big people away with taxes or whatever, then it also makes things hard for the s- small ones, right? Uh, but yeah. anyway, I, ju- I just wanted to say that, like, the, the, the idea, like, rich people are bad, business people are bad, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's just not Islamic, man. It isn't. And there was, there was a lot of companions who were very, very rich. You know, we know that from, from mm. the narrations that we, we read about. Some, yeah. some of the companions are very, very rich, fun, funding... Um, funding um, battles and you know, the armor, everything that mm-hmm. was needed for the battles, are funding mm-hmm. that, putting big amounts of money in, donating large amounts of money for other causes, and they just had a lot of money. You know, it's it's well known. Mm-hmm. So yeah. wealth in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's not it's not mm-hmm. a bad thing to want to make money. It's not a bad thing to want to be wealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it should be your sole motivator in life. Mm-hmm. But um, there's a lot of good you can do if you've got money. Mm-hmm. You know, having money is uh, there's there's baraka in it if you can use it positively um is it difficult to use it positively do you get you know do you become greedy do you become miserly these are these are the the risks and the pitfalls of getting money Mm. um but um there is benefits and i think it's better to you know we're supposed to ask for good in this dunya right we suppose you know we we ask Allah for good in this dunya good in akhira and to save us from the punishment of the fire so you're supposed to want and work towards the good of the dunya and not and not to forget your share of the world as well, right? So you're supposed to go after this stuff to the best of your ability, and not to and not to sort of obsess over it. Mm. And again, linking back to what we just said, you work for it, but you know that whatever you're going to get is already written, and you can't change that. You can only put, you can only tie your camel, so to speak. You just do what you can do, and you leave the rest up to Allah. And you don't become disheartened if it doesn't go mm. right, and if it does go right, you don't become. You try not to become proud as well, and to think that you did it. You know, or your actions did it, or you, oh, I worked twelve hours a day, so I deserved it. And I got it. That's not necessarily true. Mm. Someone else worked fifteen hours a day and got nothing. Mm. Self-made, so, baby. <laughs> yeah. So you know. Yeah. I can't remember the, the, the actual topic I was discussing mm. now, but um, mm. <laughs> you know, Rich yeah, I think I'll stop about there. I mean, also, Rich I think the, the companions. Um, you know, I think the thing is though, it depends being getting money is like good, right? Like getting a lot of money it depends who you are, but you know, generally it's good. Right. But I think the companions, what they did with it is they stay, their lifestyle stayed like moderate and then yeah. they just gave the money. Uh, having said that, if you got a lot of money and your lifestyle didn't stay moderate, like you, you upgraded your living. It's also not a problem. It's not a reason to feel guilty. And it's not a reason that mm. people should make you feel guilty. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like what you is, said, uh, mean- uh, like Allah has written your rizq, but Allah has also said, insani illa ma sa'a. It, A person doesn't get other than what they work for, you know? So Allah has written the rule that work brings results as well. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point, man. 
Um, I was about to mention something I forgot. Um, what did you mention just before that that I mentioned? Uh, yeah, the, the the companion, the upgrading your lifestyle and all that. Oh yeah, I was going to mention um, like extravagance. Yeah, like up, so up, you're talking about upgrading your lifestyle. Mm. So some people would, would see someone driving a Bentley and they'll say, "Oh, he's extravagant, right?" Um, but he may he may have millions and millions in his bank account, and that's not extravagance for him necessarily. To buy a Bentley was actually quite cheap for him, right? Yeah. Whereas someone else, if only got two or three thousand pounds in their bank account, but mm. they rented the Bentley or they're they're paying paying a lease and they're like just about keeping their head above water, that's extravagant. So extravagance is like, you know, Allah knows best, but from my understanding of what the scholars have said, like extravagance is like, um, it depends on your situation. Relative. You know? It's relative. A, a homeless person buying himself mm. uh, a 50 pound watch is extravagant because he's homeless and he's, you know, that 50 pound goes for something better. But he mm. said he bought a 50 pound watch. But for other people buying a 50 pound watch is a relatively cheap watch, you know? Mm. So, um, it depends. One one's mm. being extravagant. The other one, the other person may be being um, miserly. If he's a, if he's a millionaire, he, he refuses to buy a watch more than fifty pounds. He may be being miserly with that. You know, he, he only buys his family twenty five pound, fifty pound watches, even though he's got millions. Mm. You know, it's, it's it's relative. So, yeah, I want to make that point. Mm. Although I do think the zahid, the true zahid, yani, what's zahid in English? Uh... Um, Aesthetic, like, um, not aesthetic. Aesthetic. I mean, how do you say it again? Not aesthetic, because that's yeah. like looks. Aesthetic, no? Aesthetic. Yeah. I don't know, bro. It's the word no one really uses. Well, surely yeah, there's yeah. a better translation. Yeah, and well, someone let's, who's let's actually not break that down then, because yeah, they're not attached to they're not attached to material things. They don't need material things to make them internally happy. Probably a good. Yeah. Thing, so. No, not bothered with the dunya, yani. The true zahid, if he he could be rich, no problem. But the true Zahid yeah. would never buy a Bentley, you know. He would buy something that does the job, and that money mm. he saved from doing that, he would then spend it on something else, you know, useful. Whether you know, probably something contributing to his akhirah, whether it's spending mm. it on his family, giving it to the poor, whatever, uh, giving it to his true. parents. So I, that is the I height of I'd... taqwa, but it doesn't mean it's yeah. a kind of obligation on everyone to to be that level. So mm, yeah, that's interesting. The Zahid would never buy a Bentley. That's interesting. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I've never really thought of it that way. You know, because because the hmm, Zahid have... doesn't want anything beyond what he absolutely kind of needs. Right? Is that so, true though, or is it like you can maybe. have you can have this stuff and you just you just don't have you just don't you just don't um, value it. Well, if you don't height, value it, like, why would you buy a Bentley? Not that you don't value it, but you don't you don't you don't allow your heart to become attached to it. You know what I mean? Yeah, because so you if your have... heart's not attached to it, why would you buy it? No, you can buy things. You're not, you, you're not, your heart is not attached to your laptop. I've got a laptop. My, I don't love my laptop. That's because you're like, a Zahid, wanna... bro. I'm... <laughs> no, I'm no, not no bro, your heart's not attached to your laptop. Um, but you have a laptop because you need it to get certain things done. Yeah, but I could have bought a much cheaper laptop. This, this, wasn't, the, this wasn't the most expensive laptop on the market. But I yeah, well, one then fix like... up, innit? <laughs> I've just exposed myself, you know. <laughs> uh, no, but I, but I, I don't know. It, I, for me, bro, it's like uh, a Zahid will spend money on what is functionally, what he needs functionally. Um, and sometimes what is needed functionally might be something like a perfume, right? Because it's following the sunnah and stuff mm. to, to be presentable, all of that. Um, but then, you know, when it comes to like, and I could get the best MacBook Pro, you know, whatever that costs. How much does that cost? Like probably 5,000 pounds, 6,000 pounds. Yeah. Um, I could get the best one, but that's because it will actually help me in my work. So that's like kind of needed. Um, but then it's but a Bentley like, will help you as well, bro. How will it help? It, it depends. A, when you turn up to the meeting in a Bentley. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay, yeah. rating, no, but bro. that could, that could be a reason. <laughs> no, honestly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that it could, could be. be. So like this is what I'm saying. Thing. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like, I, I would, if I saw a brother with a Bentley, I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, he's not a Zahid. I well, you shouldn't be judging someone anyway, innit? You know, yeah, you know what I'm saying though. He was anonymous, you know, his he was a silhouette of a brother. I didn't see him. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily equate that. I can see mm. where you're coming from for mm. sure, because mm. it would it would most people, most most uh, ascetics wouldn't buy a Bentley, it's true. Mm. But I don't know if it necessarily disqualifies you. I don't know, maybe we're getting off track though, I don't know. But I just mm. it's interesting, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think honestly, like with the comfort we got in the last like hundred years we actually our definition of like 
the minimum lifestyle is just gone way out of control. Like we have mm. no connection to reality anymore in terms of what is a good living. You know, what is a, a, a comfortable living, right? And, you know, alhamdulillah, that's a, a blessing that we're living comfortably. But it's also, I feel, good to ground yourself in like, not just how other people live in the world, but just how most of humanity lived as well in the past. So, yeah. But I wanted to ask you, bro, being Muslim and, and being in business, what are the pros? What are the cons, Yanni? Not the cons, but what's the struggles, Yanni, of being a, mm. a Muslim in business? And then, but let's start with the positives. We talked about yeah, we, we, viewers already. Yeah, we mentioned them really. So again, or just to recap, like setting your own schedule first and foremost, that's like mm. really, again, money case, to one side. Mm. Yeah, in our case. But mm. again, even if you've got like a cafe, right? Mm. You could, yes, the first, the first year or two, you've got to mm. work like, you got to work like a dog. Yeah. But if you can grow it, then you can, you can set your own schedule now. Mm. You can. As long so as let, you don't put, just find more runs to hire. Yeah, that's the hard part. Once you <laughs> get past that, <laughs> we've all been there once you get past that you can begin yeah. to set your own schedule so mm. this, we, i'm thinking long term here not, not necessarily like the first year or two of business but if you can make it work you can make it grow long-term benefits right so you can set your own schedule in 95 mm. of businesses that you start i think mm. so setting your own schedule and with that comes again being able to pray your salah more easily uh in the masjid as well if it's an obligation on you uh going to juma without any worries um hajj umrah all these different things fasting ramadan tarawih uh, all these things you can do without worrying about, oh, I've got work the next day, or I've got this, or my boss is on mm. my back. The, you could this, potentially this, choose this sort of to this... just not work in Ramadan. It's not, not a lot of people can do that, though, bro. Not, they can, they've only got maybe two weeks of... No, just, no, no, I'm saying, no, no, I'm saying if you have a business. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, yeah potentially. Mm. That would be difficult as well, a whole month not working. But maybe yeah, It depends it, who you are, what your position is. Yeah, I heard uh, yesterday, uh, I think uh, Sheikh Haytham mentioned a video that one Tabi, he would choose not to work in Shaban, you know, the month before Ramadan, because mm. he's preparing, like the Prophet used to prepare for Ramadan by fasting more and everything. Uh, he just decided not, not to work for that month. And uh, yeah. yeah, so that's the type of thing you could do. Yeah, that's true. You could do that. If, if your business is doing very well, you could probably do that. Mm. Um, and also, again, it, like, that's true. And again, mm. if, you're, if your business is doing well, and you've been, you've been able to sort of save up money, then you yeah. can just like open your cafe for only two hours of the day or something yeah. like that, you know, exactly. on the equivalent, yeah. right? Um, but again, this sort of setting your schedule thing, it, mm. it sort of, it leads me on to, I mentioned this earlier as well, like unplugging yourself from the system, right? And the system, and I'm focusing on the West now, mm although it's pretty much everywhere, the system is like, is what's really holding you and your family back, really. The growth of your family's wealth, the growth of your family, and not just yeah, wealth yeah. in monetary. Mm. Uh, Illuminati, bro, 2020. <laughs> Coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. Coronavirus, man. Um, but yeah, it's like... 2012, I, World Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and other such events. Um, yeah, I was going to say... I'm not talking about wealth necessarily, <laughs> necessarily in, a, in a monetary sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the, I'm talking about growth as in like, you know, being able to, to do this thing. You're, you're setting your own schedule. So I'm plugging myself in the system. It, it involves everything I've just mentioned. It involves being able to move around freely. So again, you can move to a Muslim country. Mm. You can mm. move around con con constantly if you want to. Um, and again, if you can grow your business, um, there's no glass ceiling. This is another really important yeah. thing, right? Um, in, in a company, there's always a glass ceiling to how high you can go, really. Um, mm. Even if you go to SEO, uh, SEO, CEO status, um, there's always a glass ceiling on your earnings. You, yeah. you don't own the company, right? So you're always, yeah, you, you may earn £500,000 a year, which is mm. fantastic and amazing. Mm. Um, but that's it, right? Mm. But when you own a business, mm. there's, there's technically no limit, right? Mm. You, you may not earn anywhere near £500,000 a year but you can actually earn 5 million a year or 50 million a year or, or, or a billion a year. It's, it's technically possible. Yeah. So there's no glass ceiling in that sense. And I think that's a nicer way to live as well, where it's like, you know, whatever Allah has written for me, mm. I can technically get it. I'm in a position now to technically get that. Mm. Whereas in, in, a, in a business, I can't technically reach the billion pounds um, a year target. So that's an interesting way to, to live as well. Mm. I think those are the main benefits, man. Everything we mentioned in terms of flexibility mm. and scheduling, Mm. and that kind of stuff and how it relates to mm. the muslim lifestyle as well mm. uh, and I also being muslim benefits. and having to work on allah and knowing that you know you put in the hours and you put in the kind of research if <clears> you <throat> like to know like the most effective uses of your time 
and you go ahead yeah. and do that. And after that, you know, you can trust Allah. You can turn to Allah. You can ask Allah for help because a lot of the time, you know, business people end up in debt. They end up in very compromising situations. Yeah. Being able to turn to Allah is very important. Being able to do istikhara when you're, like I said, mm. you're making decisions sometimes in a blind manner. Um, istikhara is the ultimate, you know, help in that. Um, yes. These are big benefits as well. Have you ever like done that whole thing where you're like working and traveling at the same time? Yeah, many times. <laughs> I even got, um, uh, did I make a little vlog about it? I didn't make a vlog about it. I made a video on YouTube um, mm. about working while traveling, I think. I think mm. it's on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I did, I did it um, when I moved to Dubai as well earlier this year. I was like in a transitional phase where I was sort of like in a, ho in a hotel for like two or three weeks working. Mm. So that was kind of working while traveling. A few years ago, I, I traveled for like a month and worked the entire month. Mm. Um, so yeah, I have, mm. I have worked and traveled. I think business is like, if it's going decently well, you get all these benefits. If it's not, you're kind of, you know, sucks in a way. Yeah. But it's also a yeah. long-term thing, right? So, you know, for me, I always think in two-year things. So, like, if something's not working for two years, then, okay, maybe, yeah, it's not working. But yeah, beyond, uh, earlier than that, it's like you can't tell. Some things just take time. So, yeah, that's there's, true. There's, there's huge benefits. Um, yeah. Also, the ability and to have... Uh, influence right so influence is not just like media or whatever it's also if you employ someone you can correct some of the standards that you feel are wrong in the world right so if you feel yeah. like i don't know 20 20 days paid leave is not enough you can give your staff 30 days paid leave you know yeah uh, i'm not saying or you can give them and, or you can give them 10 days bro if you want to yeah i mean you know, no comment <laughs> i'm kidding what, what I did, but, um <laughs> But uh, yeah, so you have that kind of power. You can say, uh, you know, okay, if you work for us, these are our standards, these are our values. You know, you can follow them. Uh, something that we do is uh, we had some non-Muslim staff and we would actually get, sometimes they would want like uh, a bonus on Christmas and we wouldn't give them that, but we would give them a bonus on Eid. And that's like a way mm. of, of da'wah. And I know one uh, kind of uh, sheikh, he has a business and he, one of his... Uh, he had staff that work abroad there in a Christian country and they actually became Muslim after working with him and just hearing about wow. just little bits here and there. Um, and I suppose maybe his character also helped. Uh, they became Muslim, mm. you know, so this kind Mashallah. of, this is influence. It's not to thousands of people. It's to the people you work mm. with, but you're able to have that little change in the world where you're like, okay, I don't believe, for example, me personally, I don't believe after X o'clock or on the weekend or whatever your agreement is, I don't believe I should, you know, message my employees and expect them to reply. You know, I believe yeah. that they, they have the right to having some time where they're just not thinking about it. Um, and so I can implement that, you know, so these kind of things you can implement because you're the, the, the boss, you know? Yeah, that's very true. I agree with that as well. And on a micro, uh, on a macro scale, like that's like micro, like having that small influence on the people around you, mm. maybe to like 10, 10 different people and your clients and so, so on and so forth. Mm. But also I want to make the point where it's like, in terms of the Ummah, we don't have, like, imagine if Jeff Bezos was, was, was a Muslim. Imagine if Elon Musk was a Muslim, right? Mm. Imagine if, like, these top guys with the billions, they mm. were Muslims. Yeah, mm. imagine the, 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 um, the amount of good they could do. You know, mm. imagine how, especially in, in, in a time like this where we've got millions of refugees, uh, Muslim mm. refugees all over the world. Imagine if mm. there was a billionaire Muslim, and there probably, there are, there are billionaire Muslims, but imagine if there was more of them, right? Imagine if it was, like, you know, if somebody I don't who could think probably help maybe it's not about the money. I think there are a ton of rich Muslims, but it's about the influence in world culture, isn't it? Well, it, and that, the thing that is, comes with, with that, with that, it comes, it comes, it comes from the money. Let's be real. Mm. It, you're not, you, it comes from the money, right? Mm. And that, and the money opens that door to, mm. to give you the, the potential to have that influence. Mm. Yeah. You know, and I think most people with money could probably buy the influence if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you've got the money to do good with that, uh, if you've mm. got the money to do that and do good, then mm -hmm. fantastic. You know? yeah. So imagine from that perspective, if that was mm. you who could do that, mm. That's yeah. another, that's another motivator for me yeah, personally. Yeah. Like if I can get to that stage, mm. imagine the good I could do with that money. Yeah. Good examples is like someone like Stephen Covey, who wrote the seven habits of highly effective people. He, you know, it's one of the best, uh, I don't know how sold millions of copies, I believe. Yeah. And it's a very, it's one of those books that's about highly respected, right? How many people buy it for others? How many CEOs buy it for all their employees, whatever. Yeah. 
And mm. in the book, he makes it quite obvious, uh, quite known that he's Christian, you know. And even at the end right. of the book, uh, at the end of the book, he talks about how his faith inspired him to do X, Y, Z, whatever it was. So that's, right. again, influence, you know, and that's something mm. that you can do when you have this um, output. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, we gotta we gotta get man Larry Page on the phone and get him to become Muslim and bump the like the all the good Islamic websites to the top of the Google search. <laughs> yeah, that's it. What well, is the thing? Algorithm. Like algorithm, tweak the YouTube algorithm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's the thing. So uh, mon again, money to one side. If you get that kind of influence, you can drop those little nuggets of dawah all over the place. Mm. Like when Elon Musk tweets, mm. he tweets like one word of gibberish. Like literally, if you go to his Twitter, he'll tweet mm. like one word that no one even knows. It gets like 50,000 retweets, you know, mm. even though it's just like a stupid little mm. word or mm. a meme. Imagine yeah. if you, you had that power as a Muslim, like yeah. do, uh, drop a hadith in there or an ayah in yeah. there. Yeah. Imagine, the, imagine that. Like, mm. that's, that would be fantastic. So, mm. again, it's another motivator as well. It's another pro, mm. a pro of being a business owner. Yeah. And, and combined with the fact there's no glass ceiling, you could reach that and you could be that person who mm. gives that, that goodness to the dunya. You know, bro, there are some Muslims who are like, for example, one of the co-founders of YouTube is Muslim, or he, yeah, he's Muslim. Okay. Um, yeah. But it's just you don't, you don't really, I, I don't know if he's really like out there about being Muslim. So that's mm. uh, sometimes a shame. Also, what the co-founder of Vice, Vice Media, also Muslim. Mm. But when I say Muslim, I, I don't know how they live, but I know they're from a Muslim background, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And so it's like, it's not just about, muslims becoming these people it's about the muslims who are there um they need to be more visible uh with their islam even if you know mm. no one's perfect you know but just to mention something out there like i don't know you're doing an interview and they say hi and they say oh you know muslims we say salam alaikum that's a tiny little thing right but it's it mm. does something you know also you know the yeah, founder yeah. of loom you know loom oh yeah yeah he's muslim oh, okay, um, I don't know that. so yeah really good um, okay, what about the challenges then? Mm. Okay, challenges. You're not guaranteed any success or, any, or even a paycheck. You know, mm. You're not guaranteed any money. Yeah. yeah especially in the, uh, But that's the uh, same. Yeah. I'm talking about as a Muslim because that's the same for all. Oh, uh, okay. Mm. Okay. Um, hmm. from, okay, from I've Muslim's got one, for example, bro. Like uh, yeah, go on. when you're hiring people of the opposite sex, ah uh, okay mm. okay so this is interesting i don't necessarily see this as a con it can be an obstacle mm. it's a challenge yeah it's a challenge um so sometimes when i'm doing some hiring mm -hmm. i do come across females who are quite a good fit for a job mm. um and i just i i you know i do hesitate because i don't want to necessarily put myself in a position where i'm going to commit any any sort of like haram mm. like if i have to have a meeting with them misogyny you know, sexism it, <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, Bro, like, is there know, someone it, else on this call? <laughs> I don't know. I'm mm. certainly hearing hearing voices, man. Okay. But uh, it's just the case. Yeah, it's a case of you want to you want to build your own halal environment as well, your, your own halal work environment, and that's yeah. now a con as well. You can do mm. that. Whether that's, that's one of the pros. Digitally, yeah. yeah, one of the pros. Mm. Whereas digitally or, or or an actual physical cafe or office, you want to be able to to build that. So yeah, it can be difficult. Mm. Um, when it comes to hiring, mm. but it's so not, you never that's hired not women, yeah? Um, I haven't. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you? yeah, yeah. So I have plenty of times, uh, but we just communicate on Slack. It's all in group channels, and you know, like sometimes when someone is so far from you culturally, it's like it is a very formal relationship. So that's true. Yeah. So it doesn't, it depends. It's up to you if you want to make things casual, but the way I yeah. kind of operate when it comes to employees, I'm kind of uh, formal. So I think that's, it's, that's what you need to do. So, but mm. I think, um, there is a point at which I might want like uh, my own office and maybe employees in the office. That's when it would really get tricky. I think because it's not about me anymore. It's about, other employees of opposite sex uh, mixing with each other. And that's where it gets yeah. tricky. And I just don't have experience with that. But I think... Uh, this is the thing. So, like, the, the only reason I haven't done it, really, is because, yeah, I could keep it very, very, very formal. Mm. But as we grow, mm. maybe, if Allah wills for us to grow, we'll, you know, I like to think that my employees will be around for a long time. That's how I like to think about my employees. They're going to be with me for ages. So it's like, what kind of environment am I sort of setting in motion here All right, right now it's very uh, uh formal but eventually we're going to have like group meetings like the whole team on one call inshallah you know then what you know it's sort of like every, i mean ca casualness I've, 
you and me have been enough meetings to know that casualness like creeps in. You have an hour meeting mm. with your team. You, there's no way to stay formal that entire mm. time. You, you know, have to tell all the women every, to turn their cameras off. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. I mean, these are very real, uh, you know, as Muslims, these are very real issues for us, right? Mm. Um, there are ways around it, for sure. There are ways you can hire women. And I, and I, would, li- and I would like to, one stage, do that, maybe bring my wife into the fray in some way to make that work. Because I don't want to be one of those companies that, oh, we don't hire women. Like, I think women can do a fantastic job and women can, are you still hearing me? Uh, I can hear you, but I can't, your, your camera froze. Yeah, so is yours. So Okay, as long as the audio is there, it's probably going to come back. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely would like to hire women because I think women have, have, a, have a role to play in, in the workplace as well. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge, an obstacle, uh, but not not necessarily an impossible one, and it can be worked around, as you say. With the, you, know, you keep it formal, it can be worked around. Mm. Um, you just got to be a bit more careful with it, I, I think. Mm-hmm. What about like loans, interest, all of that? If what well, is the thing again? One of the pros is that you can ha- you can you can manage that, right? You don't have to work for a company who is taking the loans and and so on and so forth. So you mm. you've you know lo- taking loans, ribeye is not permissible permissible. So don't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think probably neither of us have that uh, been in that scenario where we kind of take loans or whatever, right? Alhamdulillah, no. Yeah, so that that but that would be a challenge because, like, if you have a capital intensive business, um, you you need to. Okay, the video came back. Um, if you have, capital I can't see you by the way. I can see myself. But I can't see you. Okay, I'll be, oh, I'll I can. I can. You're back. Okay. You're back. I was missing. Yeah. I missed you, bro. Where did you go? <laughs> I never left you. I was here the whole time. Oh, phew. Allah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you have a capital intensive business, you need money somehow, right? And I think it's interesting uh, how people navigate that. I think uh, some innovation can be done in that sense uh, to allow for you know lending or or you know investment or whatever. You know what I mean? So. Um, yeah, what is the thing? I mean, if you're going to start a business that you know you're going to need to take out loans to mm. sustain it, then don't start mm. that business. You know, I don't, I don't consider this to be a, an obstacle uh, or, a, or, or, or a con because it's like saying, oh, well, I'm going to start a casino business and I've got these... Con- well, don't mm. start a casino business then. You know, no, what's do, wrong do a with loans? Bi- Inter- uh, if it's an interest-based loan, then interest is not permissible. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but not necessarily have to be with interest. All right. If you're, okay, well, yeah. I mean... It, it, is it really realistic to? I mean, for example, to, to like uh, if you, like Tesla, let's say, yeah. How do yeah. you start that without like borrowing money or taking a ton of capital, like uh, investment? You talk about investment or, or loans. There's two different things. Yeah, so you need one of the two or both, probably. Well, investment is one. You, could, you can take investment in your company where you yeah. where they invest and they get yeah. a share of the company and share of the profits. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, but a loan yeah. is different. If you're taking mm. a loan from the bank to start your business, then don't yeah. start that business. Yeah, like, there are, there are other ways to start a business. Yeah, I, I feel like I guess there are some governments have like funds for entrepreneurs, um, where you can borrow money with no interest and stuff. So that that could be the yeah, the gateway. Th- there's ways, because and and I'm, the thing is, like, let's say you have a, a cafe, you have one location, it's doing well. You you know your profit is probably going to be five ten percent, right? So you're not going to yeah. be able to save up enough to open a second location, even though things are going well. So that's when usually people would take a loan. But, uh, and you could say, well, just get investment. But why would you, you don't want to dilute yourself. Like, you know, so. Um, no, man. This should is, be no, some... this is, I, don't, I disagree. I, this isn't the way that if the alternative is, is interest. Then, no, I'm not talking about interest. Not, not talking about. I'm just saying okay. loans in general. They oh, yeah, are the, yeah, usual, course, the yeah, normal man. way oh, yeah. to if, grow. If there's a if there's a if there's a government grant that gives you an interest free loan, then yeah, for sure, take take advantage of it. If you've got an investor who's willing to invest and only take a very small percentage, mm. then take it. Um, yeah. If there are if there are interest free loans out there, mm. I don't think I don't think interest free loans are very common. Quite frankly, yeah, there not, are yeah. some government grants, but they're not gonna. I don't think they're gonna change anybody's world. Um, so yeah, I mean, mm. if, you're, if you're on the subject of loans and stuff, just make sure there's no interest involved. Mm. I know, yeah, it, uh, so when fun. the, you know, around 2012 ish, like Arab spring kind of time, the Algerian government was trying to calm everyone down and they set up this scheme where it's like, if you want to start a business, we'll just give you cash, like just apply. Mm. Yeah. Some of the applications must've been ridiculous because all of a sudden you start seeing people driving around in new cars 
and it's obvious they're not using the money for business. Yeah. And then like a year, like a few years later, they say, oh, you know, the business just failed and so it didn't work out and all of that. So it has to be done properly, <laughs> properly of course. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. I mean, look, that's fine. If, if, if there's a permissible way to get a loan, yeah, then fine, go for it. But if there's interest involved, steer clear. There are yeah. plenty of other ways to start a business, especially like a service-based business, right? Mm. The startup costs are very... I would suggest pe- most people start with a services type of business, which is like what we're doing or mm. what I'm doing anyway, uh, which is like very, you don't need much money to start this business, you know? Yeah. Uh, I bet you started with zero, much. right? Pretty much. Yeah. I mm. mean, I had, I had to handle some savings, but I didn't have to invest a huge amount into the mm. company. to. But start did you be, uh, you know, before you got your first, you know, payment, first bit of revenue, had you in mm. what, how much had you invested at that point when you got the first amount of revenue? Good question. I can't remember. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, hmm. probably no more than, no more than like a 1,500 pounds. No more than that. Okay. Cause I remember yeah, this is the that. thing with the service business is that we, um, when we got our first amount of revenue, we hadn't spent anything. Uh, and then we used mm. that first client's, uh, you know, payment to get a website up get branding done and stuff. Okay. So yeah. that's what you can do with a service-based business. Yeah. Um. To, yeah. To be honest, we had. I mean, I had. It's, it's, a, it's a. For me, it's a blurred line because I had like freelancer clients, and yeah. I suppose that kind of funded it. So I don't mm. know. It, it, but I, I did. I, for the actual company itself, I didn't spend that much money. Mm. Probably underneath a grand, to be honest. By the time I actually got the actual client uh, for the business itself, mm. uh, and again, that was like for setting up the website. Um. Mostly for uh, yeah, I think we were setting up the website a little bit um maybe i hired did i hire i didn't hire someone straight away it was it was a few bits and bobs here and there but mm. it wasn't it wasn't a lot of money yeah mm-hmm. and that's it basically just like a bit of marketing spend yeah, yeah. that's pretty much all it was mm. okay uh how long I've got have a question we been going for now, okay i don't know oh uh, it usually has a timer i literally no, have no have idea timer. i don't know either it's like it's gone 1 1 p.m let me ask you a question though Go on. So this is for you and me have both worked in the, in a nine to five, right? I, I worked for my dad for a couple of years and I believe you worked nine to five at one point. Yeah. Not for long though. Not for long. Well, mine was less than two years. I don't know if that counts as long, but what do <laughs> Bro, you Mine miss? was six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you worked for a few months somewhere. No, I worked for like, uh, uh, two years or whatever, but, uh, it was, well, okay. I worked probably two and a half years. But there was never nine to five, right? It was either um, kind of hourly situation or like teaching, mm-hmm. which is not nine to five. So, okay, right, yeah. okay, interesting. Mm. I'll, I'll ask you this question anyway. Mm. What What do you miss about that life? Even if it's a six week lifestyle, do you miss anything about that, or are you glad you don't have to have that kind of schedule? I don't miss anything. No, same. <laughs> same. I, I, I work obviously, I'm saying years, that. I'm saying that because like things have gone all right, you know. Um, but if that. things hadn't gone all right, you're rich, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean. So even though, um, like, if I was still there now, for example, in that job, I'd be earning more than now, probably. But. Uh, I don't know. I just think you, you've got to decide what you want to prioritize in life. And I mm. have not prioritized the pure amount I earn. I've prioritized that partly, but then also lifestyle partly, flexibility partly, halal environment partly, you know, praying in the masjid partly. So, um, you know, taking all those things into account, I can't say I miss anything because even the stable income, there was a big price to pay for that. So, yeah, mm. I mean, uh, after that six week kind of job, uh, six, six weeks working, they basically fired me. They said, you know, I think you should do your own thing. Like you were doing your own thing, like before, before we hired you and that probably suits you better. And I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Quality. Yeah. I think I'm pretty much, uh, in the same boat as you. I did work for my dad for a couple of years, as I mentioned, and I'm mm. very grateful that he gave me that. And it was like, I learned a lot. Mm. Um, but I, like I said, growing up, I didn't want to work for anybody. I didn't like office environments. I didn't want to be, you know, n- you know, pegged down like that really. Uh, 
both schedule wise and just like everything wise, you know, and I was glad mm. to get out of there. And I was the whole, whole time I was there, I was planning my, my route out. Mm. So um, mm. I don't really miss anything to be honest. Mm. Maybe you could say, you know, the office atmosphere, it, it does become nice. It becomes uh, familiar, mm. but I don't, I, I wouldn't say I miss it. Uh, I think, yeah, I don't really miss mm. it. To be honest. You know, the thing that drove me nuts the most was the culture of, like, obviously, I was naive, okay? And that's probably why I got fired, right? I went into the job thinking they want performance, okay? They want someone who knows what they're doing. They're going to go. They're going to execute. They're going to get. In the end, I'm going to make them money. I'm going to make them more money than they're paying me, yeah? Right. Uh, and I was just wrong about that. And that drove me nuts because I came into work every day thinking, let me, let me do a sick job. And it turns out they don't care so much about that. What they care is you know, how much you make them look good and all of that stuff. So that drove me nuts. Also, it's like, I'm, I'm going into work to work and not socialize, but everyone seems to be socializing. I'm there, I've got earphones, I've got white noise playing, so I can't hear these people next <laughs> yeah, to me. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to like bang out work. And, yeah. and because of that, because of being focused yeah. and white noise and all that, they don't like you because of that. So definitely not the kind of environment for me. There are jobs where, they like that. They, 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 they like performance. They appreciate the bringing someone in who's just going to get sweatshops. Good... <laughs> 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 yes, yes. Um, yeah. But there are some companies where they genuinely want the best people out there who just work. And I'm sure, you know, I'd be better there, that kind of place. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm not, especially, I'm very picky with who I socialize with anyway. So if you throw me into a random office with random people, you know, mm. nine of 10 of them, I'm not really going to want to mix with. Um, yeah. Oh, so yeah. Not to mention uh, having, you know, a mixed environment in the office. Not good, man. Mm. Um, but uh, Alhamdulillah, just, I don't know, I'm so direct. So I just made it clear, like, just don't talk to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. I'm sure that went down well. Yeah, I mean, it's all these things like uh, being principled, uh, being rigid. Um, uh, they don't go down well in that kind of situation, in it. So mm. um, I think, you know, I could do it right now. I've learned lessons from that. If whatever happens, I need to go and get a job. I can do it, inshallah. I, I wouldn't really like it, but uh, I yeah. could do it. I'm willing to do it. It's fine. Uh, I don't look down on jobs. You know what I mean? Like most people are yeah. working in a job. That's fine. That's good. And sometimes it allows you to... For example, in business, you have to be good at, at marketing, sales, uh, finance, operations, uh, HR. Um, you have to be a, a manager. You have to be a you know, motivator and all of that. But uh, if you have a job, you just have to be good generally at like one or two things. So sometimes that's better yeah. for, for certain people as well. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you, man. I agree with you. One more question from me. If um, Allah forbid your both of our businesses were just like destroyed tomorrow yeah something happened and uh, what business have gone tomorrow would you start a new business or would you um would you would you like apply for jobs uh so you're saying like my business just got destroyed yesterday kind of situation yeah and yeah and put finances aside like, i don't know i'm not asking about how much savings you've got or anything like that i'm just saying like purely from like you know how would you want to move forward if you if you had to start again would mm. you continue on you know, the entrepreneurship path or would you try something different? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I would definitely continue in business. I would probably, I would, I would spend some time trying to lower my monthly costs as much as possible, even if it means moving to another country. And then I would just mm. get back at it with a new business. What about you? Same, same. Mm. I would do whatever needs to be done. Again, finances, if we are talking about finances, I'd just like, if I had to stack shelves, I'd stack shelves or whatever, and then mm -hmm. just try and get a new business off the ground because, yeah, like yeah. I mentioned earlier, like just I, I feel that need to have a business. I don't really, I don't see it as an option to go back to, to work for somebody on a on a long term basis. Mm. To be honest. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's just so me. yeah, if I didn't have the finances, I would uh, drive for Uber. I would uh, oh, yeah, stack yeah. shelves. I would do something, especially like these Uber kind of things. I know people say you can't make a full time income. I don't know the truth about that, but I would try and get my expenses low as possible. Drive for Uber, however long that I need to do that, even if yeah. it's like eight hours a day, and then uh, work on the business. And I would see the Uber thing as a 
six month thing maximum maybe yeah. try and you know try and replace my income in six months i would do that inshallah I, I was i was talking to an uber driver yesterday or two days ago mm. and he was saying he was earning 500 dirhams a day mm. right which is before they cut or after they cut after is after Allah. so that means he's earning three thousand pounds a month if he's working seven days a week three thousand pounds a month mm, pretty that's damn good. great and he's probably so, got his accommodation paid and no tax to pay as well probably uh, but even if he doesn't he's still living quite comfortably yeah so yeah man wow that's go. really good so it's very that, good. that level of demand yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm sure he's working very hard i'm mm. sure he's working like eight nine hours a day but mm. it's not bad is it really no that's good uh, but i think in dubai uber is a more of a luxury price like a premium price right yeah it, it is but I, yeah. I, I think it's about the same as london still like the tech because the taxis here are very cheap uber mm. is like pretty much the same as uber in london in terms if anything it may even be a little bit cheaper to be honest i've already checked but mm. but yeah so so I mean, you're saying uber here is the same as uber x like you know uber x in london the same price uber x like the, the standard one right uber x yeah. yeah 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 i think so i haven't really checked it but i think so. i don't really use uber that often i try not to because it is a bit more expensive than normal taxis mm. but i think it's about the same as london i'll check i'll mm. check mm. Okay, bro. I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I think we covered all the points I had in mind. Do you have anything? No, I think we covered everything, bro. Alhamdulillah. I think it was, uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, man. at least it was a real conversation instead of an interview. Yeah, man. I, I definitely didn't want to sort of be the, the guy in the spotlight again. So alhamdulillah, it was good that we could sort of bounce off each other a bit more. Yeah. How, uh, what about uh, like, a, you know, these, let's end on this, okay? Yeah. Business environment uh, with this uh, Corona kind of uh, outbreak, COVID nineteen outbreak. What do you, what's your feelings business wise? Maybe for your for your business, but Illuminati. As well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, my feeling, my personal feelings. Um, I've been, I've only gone out in the last week twice to just go to the supermarket. Mm. Um, so that's kind of taking its toll on me a little bit. I don't want to complain, bro, because alhamdulillah, we're, we're in a good position in the world here. Alhamdulillah. Uh, like in terms of, like we could be in Italy or we could be in Spain or China or America right now. Mm. Um, so that, I mean, you know, it is taking its toll a little bit, but don't want to complain at all. Alhamdulillah. We're in a very good position. Uh, and alhamdulillah, we're not infected. May Allah protect us all. Um, so from that perspective, well, we it's like be, a bit We just don't know. We might, oh, I'll laugh a bit, uh, but yeah. And, and at the end of the day, um, it, it, it's fine. It's fine. Honestly, it's fine. We're at home. We've got, we've got internet, we've got TV, we've got laptop, we've got work to do. It's fine. Um, not going to complain about that. Uh, in terms of business, it's been, alhamdulillah, again, normal, to be honest. I haven't really noticed anything. Um, yeah, so I can't really complain about anything, to be honest with you. Mm. The only thing that's changed in my life is that I was supposed to go back to the UK two days ago or three days ago uh, mm. and we had to cancel that flight because the uk is kind of mad at the moment and i'm not really trying to go through dubai airport either or going to a plane because it just seems like just like almost guaranteed to get get infected really if i, if I do that mm. and then uk itself is not not looking too healthy right now mm. so we decided to put that on hold which is a shame because i do miss my family i want to go back and see my family we were planning to like do two and a half months here and go back for about a month you know ease everybody into us moving here but um, it doesn't look like we're going to be going back for a while now. I don't know how long, but that's, that's difficult because I miss my family. My wife misses her family. So that's probably the biggest issue that we're facing right now. But mm. still, alhamdulillah, everyone's healthy. Everyone's fine. Inshallah, everyone stays healthy. Mm. And all listeners, all listeners stay healthy as well, inshallah. What about like your prospects for business? Like next six months, you think it's going to be pretty standard or? I don't know, bro. Um, my, my target audience, my target market is software companies um mainly dealing with other businesses so i don't know Allah knows best um technically speaking some of my clients should be fine because their their software is kind of essential software but you never know you never know to be honest like it depends on what the economy looks like in, in a few months time and no you know Allah knows best about that mm. don't know. yeah and what about you know like in the uk they got this um what do they call it? Stimulus or whatever package. Mm-hmm. Um, and they said that they're going, they're, they're guaranteeing salaries for employees. I don't know if it's all employees yeah, or whatever. 
percent of the salary up to 2,500 pounds a month. Yeah. So that's mad. But then they also got something for uh, self-employed or business people and stuff, right? Yeah. Self-employed people. Mm. I, um, as a business owner, you don't fall into that category because you're not technically self-employed. You're the company employs you. So you're technically an employee. That's my understanding of it. Yeah. Oh, so <clears> you freelancers get... and self-employed people are like the, hmm. they're just like, they're freelancing. Mm. So I would fall under the employee bracket, I believe. Even then, I don't think they've given proper guidance on if directors are, are part of that or if it's just employee, like normal employees. Um, but I would imagine the directors fall into it as, fall into it as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, mm, okay, one or the other. So what I was thinking about this and that's like, you know, in business, like being self-employed or that's kind of cheating in it. Like I understand if you're, if you're an employee, you get fired, uh, you, they have job seekers allowance, you know, it's for someone who's seeking a job. Yeah. But yeah. as a business person, when you fail, you just fail and you have to like take the loss head on, you know? And in this, in this case, it seems like that blow is being softened and, I don't know. Of course, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's like going against yeah. the ethos of business, you know? What is the thing? I mean, these are the same governments that would have said, oh, we don't intervene, we don't intervene in the market and we, don't, we let the market yeah. regulate itself. Mm. But when push comes to shove, um, when businesses are going to go out of business on, on mass, yeah, yeah. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to collapse the economy. So they kind of had to, yeah. uh, which, kind of, which kind of blows apart their entire philosophy and, and economic ethos mm. um but that's, i don't know i'm not i'm not an economist but um as far as like cheating everybody every, every you know everybody's getting the same treatment so it's kind of a level playing field so it doesn't really matter to, to it's almost as if they've done nothing because everybody's getting the same treatment um but there will be people there will be people slipping through the cracks and i suppose it just keeps people it just keeps businesses afloat and as long as everybody takes advantage of it which they probably will then it's going to be an equal a level playing field, I suppose. Well, the thing is, in business, it shouldn't be a level playing field if you think about it, right? Because it should be based on yeah. your business uh, well, acumen, right? Well, some businesses will, will be more prepared for this day than others. You know, yeah, some businesses true. will, yeah, some businesses will have like six months worth of liquid cash yeah. to pay their people and reserve. Yeah. Other businesses won't even be able to make it to the end of the month. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, true. it's equal treatment, but not equal playing field. So the business, mm. you know, the business acumen will still come into play. Yeah. I don't That's think, true. I don't think what the government doing is doing in the UK is going to necessarily save any businesses that have been poorly run. If the business has been poorly run, mm. this will definitely help, but it'll probably, it's probably more like putting a plaster on, on like a, yeah. a gushing wound, you know, it's yeah, going to, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying gonna, it's, it's bad by the way. I'm just, it's interesting because I mean, I just feel like uh, we're just being babysat by governments, man. And I don't know when I do, yeah. when things go downhill or when I make a mistake, I like to see the consequences for myself. I don't really want daddy to come and save me. You know what I mean? But I'm you saying want, that. You want to be uh, left out in the desert, innit? Yeah. Left I mean, out in the desert, hunt, hunting, man. Hunter gatherer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that as somebody who's, you know, not yet affected right so yeah you know, obviously that. things change when your circumstances change you start saying yo daddy yeah. can i have that yeah, bail out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah man. I, I, I wouldn't i definitely wouldn't judge anybody who's in that position who needs to bail out because it is tough you know and it, this is like an unprecedented massive like, global issue mm. uh, and it's you know they, they might argue you know how could how could we have prepared for this which isn't which is a poor argument but you know it is a pretty mad situation so I again, I don't disagree with what the UK government has done. I'm not an economist. I haven't really looked into it too deeply. But um, yeah, some, some businesses will be bailed out when perhaps they should have just been left to die. But I, there's mm. also, it, it's mainly for those massive companies like British Airways, other massive companies who they need to do this so that they can stay afloat. Because if they go down, then the entire economy goes down and everybody loses. So I don't think this, I don't think this is necessary to support the small guys who are on the on the cusp of going out of business anyway. Mm. It was more to like, you know, these massive companies who need to pay their staff. They've got like hundred thousand staff. This mm. is for them, kind of thing. I saw that the U.S. they wrote in a law to help out um, people. That, no, you know, it's for because in the U.S. in most states they don't have sick pay for 
Mm. Um, for I don't know anyone in it, like any of these lower. Yeah. It's like by choice that you give sick pay, right? So yeah, yeah. they wrote a law um, obligating companies to give sick pay or saying the government would cover sick pay, but only mm. if you hire, uh, I think it was l more, I think. No, no, less, yeah. Less than 500 people. Okay. okay. So if you, if you work for someone who has more than 500 employees, then they don't have to give you sick pay. So those people are still going right. to be going to work and still you know spreading the virus and stuff so that's a bit mad but uh yeah yeah ultimately you either do this kind of activity probably i mean of course i don't know the exact the options out here but it seems there's two options do what they're doing or just let the economy just completely fail and collapse um yeah so they're just obviously doing taking the obvious uh, choice here but i do worry about in order to give, I think the UK said they're giving 350 billion. That's the size of the package. So where's that money coming from? Mil you know? I, think it was, I think it was million. I think it's 360 million and then more if it's needed. Something like that. I don't think it was billion. Was it billion? That's what I remember. But 360 million sounds like nothing. So It does, sounds... but 360 billion sounds like mad. Oh no, it must have been, free. It must have been billion. Yeah, it must have been billion. Yeah, yeah. And the US sells yeah. two or three trillion in it. So where's yeah. this money coming from? This is coming is from the thing? Um, uh, probably sorry, just printing new money, isn't it? So print new money, yeah. devalue the currency. Quantitative easing. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I don't know if that's going to be good overall, but hey, what do I know? It's not, uh, unfortunately. It's not going to be good for long-term economy. That's why the pound is probably suffering as well, but all economies are going to suffer in the same, same way. Yeah. Um, but I saw a tweet, um, well, not the Sky News tweet, so it's like an official, official news, the UK government yesterday instructed all the local councils to house all of the homeless people and people sleeping rough, mm. right? Yesterday, they gave them the authority to do that, which means they always could have done. Mm. Yeah. They always could have done. Yeah. So think about, let that sink in for a moment. All this time, all those homeless people on the streets who are like, <clears> you know, freezing on the streets, they could have been housed mm. literally overnight because that's what the government said. They, they didn't even allocate additional funds, I don't think. They just said, oh, yeah, just make sure you house them, yeah? Mm. So that was it. So in other words, it always could have been done. Mm. It wasn't that difficult to do. And it took, it actually, even now they don't care. The only reason they're doing that is to stop the spread so the economy doesn't collapse. Yeah. They it's got money more. for war but can't feed the poor. Exactly, bro. <laughs> <laughs> El Elton John. Elton John is fantastic. <laughs> um... <laughs> um... Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I mean, that shows priorities, I suppose. I mean, I, I understand that. Um, the thing is, yeah, I understand the difficult position governments are in, right? Because there's so much entitlement from the population, which is partly the fault of the government anyway, but uh, there's so much entitlement, uh, so much blame comes on you. So let's say, for example, you housed homeless people for two months, which maybe that's what they're going to do, by the way. Let's say they're only going to house them for two months. Probably. Yeah. Um, if you did that in a normal time, you said, look, people's lives are a priority you know we, we want to give everyone shelter so we're going to house you yeah but then after two months if they ran out of money and then they said well you got to go everyone be going nuts but the truth is they're yeah. trying their best you know what i mean so i think there's too much entitlement out there and there's too much um confidence and reliance on human um like abilities right rather than turning to allah and saying look you know you you decree what is best you have power to do, to do everything. And the fact that you're, you've put us in a world which is the way it is, you know, that's from based on your you know, ultimate wisdom and stuff. But instead of yep. that, that uh, attitude, obviously, Kufar, their attitude is entitlement and the government should have done this. And like, you know, uh, Boris Johnson went on a press, uh, what's it? Uh, press uh, conference saying, conference. you know, people are, gonna, people are gonna die. A lot of people are gonna die, yeah? Mm. And people go nuts at that. And it's like, Yes, like people are going to die. Like it's not everything is in humans' control. You know, not everything in human. They think like, uh, I think people living in comfort, they are so blinded to the fact that there are some things that humans simply cannot do. Like people assume a vaccine is on the way. Like maybe yeah. there's no vaccine on the way. Yeah. Um, I understand it's maybe insensitive to say, yeah, people are going to die. Maybe they un people understood it as him saying, people are going to die. We're not really going to do much about it. Okay, that's a problem. But in the end, humans are not able to just do everything, right? Not everything is just a matter of time. Yeah, bro. You know what it is? I see no changes. 
All I see is racist faces, man. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> So much inspiration so, today, Kai. I don't know where you got it. Yeah, from. bro. I don't know, man. Inspiration should come from somewhere. Okay. And with that, <laughs> we'll wrap this episode <laughs> up. I didn't give it a number because I don't know exactly when we're going to put it out. It looks like we're going to put it out mm. as episode 70, though, inshallah. Uh, last words, Kai. Please, no more lyrics. <laughs> yeah. Last words. Um, I think I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier, which is like, I do encourage people to try to start a business, try to monetize something they're already doing as a hobby perhaps, or, or start, start something like some sort of side hustle. Whether you've already got a job or you're a you know, stay-at-home mum, whatever, I think it's worth trying it out, worth experimenting. And if it works, then the benefits are, are, are substantial. And if it doesn't work, then alhamdulillah. Mm. Okay, great. And with that, I'll say subhanAllah <coughs> wa bihamdika, shadu wa la ilaha la anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Everyone, go to mindheistpodcast.com for your questions. Uh, send us your questions by email by Curious Cat anonymously if you want. Uh, follow us on Instagram there as well. And you could just also just scroll through the, uh, the episodes there if you're on a desktop or something. Uh, yeah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum everyone else. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.